about that. How he fishes shallower, how he finds he's out of the way. I think you got, weren't you guys out fishing today? Kind of. Eh. More like trying to focus on Welcome everybody to Bash University Live on this Tuesday night. We've got a, a fun show, one that I've really been looking forward to and excited about. And uh, if you're a crankbait guy like me, uh, this is going to be a great show for you. We've got an amazing uh, individual in the world of crankbait design that's going to be with us tonight. We have Lee Sisson of Bagley Baits fame, and he has done work for so many crankbait companies and influenced so much crankbait design and crankbait fishing uh, from the beginning, back in the in the 70s and the 80s, and, and really revolutionized this game. We're going to be talking to him how the deep diving crankbait came about, how this whole revolution got started. He was right there doing it, and um, we're, and we're going to be talking about everything uh, crankbait design. So bring your questions. If you're a crankbait nut uh, like me, uh, it's going to be a great show. He's going to be with us here in, in just a little bit. And we've got a, a great uh, cast with us tonight that um, I'm excited to have. We have uh, Pat Renwick's going to be with us tonight from Straycast, another crankbait nut, a uh, you know real student of the sport. And we're going to be he's going to be talking with Lee and us and Epic Eric, who we've seen on some of you guys may remember from previous episodes. He's been with us before. And um, uh, several times, Eric has one of the most amazing crankbait collections that exists on the planet and a tremendous knowledge about crankbait. So we were going to have one of our heroes on the show, Lee Sisson, coming up in just a little bit. And we're going to be talking crankbaits uh, here on Bash University live tonight. So get your questions ready, guys. If you are a subscriber to Bash University TV, we use your questions live on the air. We are going to be hooking you up with some cool swag uh, go over to the IM board at bashu.tv and we will pick your questions from there. And if you are watching over on Facebook, we have a like and share contest that we are going to be giving away an amazing prize for uh, one, one of the folks that likes and shares us over there. Riz, take it from here. What do we got for the guys tonight? Well, tonight, Pete, for the Facebook like and share, um, we're going to be giving away a little TH Marine prize pack. To, uh, yes. to celebrate the fact that TH Marine has been in business for 45 years. 45 years, TH Marine has been giving you the absolute best products you could ever have from transom to trolling motor for your boat. So the Facebook Like and Share winner tonight is going to get hooked up with a little prize pack from them. And uh, as always, we're going to have a grand prize that's going to be for a trivia question tonight. And that is a crankbait box. The crankbait box is going to be a flambo box that's absolutely loaded to the teeth with Rappola crankbaits. It's going to be valued at uh, about $75. So if you want to have a shot to win that crankbait box on tonight's show, make sure you head over to BashUTV and use the code BULIVE30. You can get unlimited access to the website for 30 days for free. And you can interact with me on the message board to get your questions through to tonight's show. And, guys, anybody that submits a question that we use on the air tonight, you're getting hooked up. Rappola crankbaits and Bash University official face shields are headed your way. So take advantage of the code BULIVE30. Get 30 days of free access to over 700 of the best bass fishing videos on the web. Outstanding. And of course, we got uh, BTC pushing the buttons, getting us off right. on time as usual. Yeah, man. How about that? I think we actually started a couple seconds before seven. Rich, how many dollars did you say that prize pack was worth? Uh, that prize pack is worth about $75. So oh, that's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good Sweet. one. That's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, very excited for tonight, man. We got, uh, got some, a lot of energy in the room. A lot, well, in the Zoom, a lot of energy in the Zoom tonight. So, yeah, for it's gonna be absolutely. Yeah. yeah, the guys are the guys are crankbait heads, you know, and, and I've been wrestling with them and, and uh, you know, from ledge fishing patterns to shallow grass patterns, 
you name it, crankbaits have been a staple in, in fishing. It's just one of the coolest ways to fish. And it's won BTC. It's won so many tournaments. That's right. Uh, so many classics. So many uh, big tournaments have been won cranking. And we're going to be talking with a guy tonight that, that started this whole thing. That's right. Let's get it going, man. I'm ready. We're going to take a quick we got to take a quick break and bring everybody in. That's right. Let's take a quick commercial break. It'll be about three, four minutes and uh, get the party started. Outstanding. We will be right back uh, with the crew at Bash University Live. Why do you love casting fishing rod? I'm truly losing less fish. It is the sensitivity of the rod. That they're made right here in North Carolina in the USA. Strongest, lightest rod, 100% made here in Sanford, North Carolina. From the drop shot rod to the flipping stick. Every rod has a purpose to it, and I rely on them all the time when I'm out there in a tournament. Durability in the John Cruz Worming Series, the counterbalancing in the handle. It's the only rod I found that can withstand my hook set. Boom goes the dynamite. Every moment on the water not spent fishing is a moment wasted. That's why Minn Kota and Humminbird have joined forces to bring you the One Boat Network. Products that communicate and integrate to help you take full command of your boat. Born from our commitment to making the most advanced fishing gear even better by making it work together, the One Boat Network will help you find, get to, stay on, and catch more fish. When One Boat Network products talk to each other, they can navigate your boat automatically. They can give you a crystal clear view of what's below with no messy wires. And they can let you lower, raise, and change shallow water anchor modes from anywhere on the boat. But that's just the beginning. We're never done innovating, integrating, and making your boat simpler and easier to control. All so you can make every second on the water count. Tackle Warehouse is proud to sponsor the FLW Pro Circuit and is the official tackle retailer of FLW. Providing proven bass fishing gear as well as the newest and hottest tackle. Our friendly and knowledgeable customer service staff can help you every step of the way. And we offer free ground shipping on orders over $50. Tackle Warehouse. Everything for the bass angler at the lowest prices. Guaranteed. I have to be constantly on the lookout for new techniques to stay on the top of my game. Giant. Some have been more Giant. successful oh God, than others. Giant. The finesse fingernail. It happens every time. The chain gang. Oh God. Ah, broke it off. The crow's nest. Never let go. And don't even get me started on tackle management, especially trying to stop rust and corrosion. Peanut butter. Hmm, I could. Motor oil. Gotta keep the rust off all these baits. WD-40. Gotta keep the rust off. Silica, toothpicks, Q-tips, the list goes on and on. I'm hard on tackle, I fish fast, I need my tackle organized and protected. I can't be worrying about losing baits to rust. And when it comes to tackle management, there's only one solution. Flambo tackle storage systems with Z Rust technology. The original anti rust tackle box. Uncompromised clarity. Renowned durability. The infused anti rust option that is FDA safe and free of harmful chemicals. The organization options are endless, but there's only one. One box, one anti corrosion technology, one family owned American made brand, Flambo. Z Rust Tackle Solutions. Preserve, perform, repeat. I don't know. We'll see. I hope it holds up. Oh, dude. This, 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 is, this is, uh, yeah. This will be the dial back version. Sorry. All right. Sorry, we're live. Oh, sweet. We're live. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Love it. Welcome back, guys. Welcome back. Um, uh, we, um, we're we back with Bash University live tonight. We've got an amazing show. We're going to be talking about crankbaits with, with two guys that are just shot out of a cannon when it comes to talking about crankbaits. And, and two of my favorite people, I see uh, Straycast. I see Pat Renwick. 
good to have you with us, buddy. Pete, it's, it's amazing to be here. I, I'm so happy to be back on the on the uh, Bass University, man. It's been a minute, you know? Yeah, well, of course, you guys recognize Pat from a lot of the classic interviews, and uh, some of you have seen him MC uh, at some of the Bass University events. So, uh, well, it's great to have you tonight, and we are joined uh, with Epic Eric, who is another uh, getting to be regular on the Bass University show. Mr. Eric, how are you tonight? Man, fantastic. So stoked to be here. When I got the call, it was just, you know, the excitement and the ideas and the pre-conversation to the show was just fantastic. So stoked that Lee Sisson is going to be on tonight and, uh, you know, joining Pat and you, Crankbait Nuts of the Century. Pete, going back with some on-the-water training with you, man, just we had some dynamite days. So stoked to to get the show going. I know, Thank you. Well, <laughs> I think in our inner circle, Eric, you were known as the man with the greatest uh, lure collection, you know, for a thousand miles of anywhere, you know, around here. It's, it's a zillion miles, may I correct you? <laughs> in the whole Bass Galaxy, that is the that is an epic uh, collection, sir. I'm still building, still building, man. There's no uh, one that has a collection like you. I just we need well, to hear that. I don't know about that, but thank you for saying so, man. Been 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 building it since the '70s. Since I was a wee little lad, bass fishing. Impressive. Is that, is that right? Is that when you got started in this, Eric? For some reason, I thought you got into bass fishing a little bit later. But you, oh, you were bass fishing early. I was a paper boy, and I bought a lifetime subscription to Bassmasters Magazine. I paid 150 bucks for that lifetime subscription, still getting it today. Oh, no. And so that's when I started collecting. Yeah. No, Always no. had an efficient, you know, just an uh, affection for different lures and techniques. And, you know, the Bassmasters magazine really fed that for me. Right. Yeah. Sure. Pat, you got to get a guitar next time he tells that story. Yeah, I will. I, I, that's real easy to do. It's here. <laughs> <laughs> it's right next to me. <laughs> did, did you get started early, Pat? As far as my bass fishing? Yeah. Oh, my goodness, Pete. Um, yeah, uh, I uh, I started way back. Um, long story short, uh, the gentleman that is the president of Pure Fishing right now, his name is Dave Baltice. Um, he, uh, let's call it as weird as this sounds, discovered me at a bait store on the south side of Chicago. Um, he brought me, um, got my parents permission. I worked for him at sports shows in the Chicago land area for JL Trebu Company under Dave Baltice and the one and only Jim Bagley. So nice. um, I've been, I actually was one of the youngest uh, field testers. Uh, they called them field testers back then, not pro staff. Uh, yeah, I remember I, that. I became a, a field tester when I was nine years old. And it, uh, uh, Jim Bagley and Wayne Davis, um, Jim Bagley, obviously the president of Bagley Bates, and Wayne Davis being the vice president of Bagley Bates, they took a liking to me and uh, even brought myself and my family down to Winter Haven, Florida on a few occasions to, to visit the factory, fish the phosphate pits, and uh, nice. even, uh, link with a, a gentleman named William Dance. So uh, that was pretty fun as a kid, you know. Uh, so to answer your question, Pete, in a nutshell, yeah, I've been at this a minute. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I love it. I didn't know that history of you and Bagley's. Yeah, um, I have. Uh, in, in fact, I was showing uh, 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 the gentleman in the pre-show. Uh, my This is my original Bagley card that Jim Bagley had printed up for me when I was 10 years old. And it's on the wood grain uh, Bagley finish. It says Pat Renwick, uh, a promotional staff field tester. Wow. Right there. And, uh, Man. and I have a I have a half dozen of these laying around the house somewhere, you know, but um. Frame that, dude. Frame it. Yeah, I, I got them. And uh, there's giant Bagley patches here in the studio uh, that, that hang w uh, throughout. And, and tons of these original Bagley patches here that I have uh, throughout the home as well, along with uh, old Bagley baits, which you guys are mm. all familiar with right there. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, man, I've been, at, uh, I've been yeah. at this a while, and then I got too cool and got into rock and roll and then got back into it in bass fishing broadcast. And here we are today, Pete Klusing. There, there, well, it's it, it's pretty neat. Surprising you hold that Bagley's patch up because in my early tournaments, that patch was on my jersey. Uh, I I represented Bagley's for a few years early in, in my career. And, uh, you know, 
because I, you know, there was a couple other baits and we're going to talk about them tonight that I just fell in love with. And, um, you know, they, they worked extremely well, but, uh, I, I remember, can you guys remember, I remember the first, uh, hard bait crankbait fish that I caught. Um, and it was monumental. It changed my world. And, uh, th this particular bait, my very first bass came on a Rapala floating minnow. Mine too, and Pete. Mine too. Is that, is that right? My life, man. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Which size and what color? It was black and silver. And honestly, I couldn't, I could tell you, it's, it wasn't one of the larger ones, yeah. uh, but it wasn't one of the minis. It just, I, as I recall, it was three or four inches. Yeah. Mine was, and, uh, yep, yep. Black yep. and silver. As I, but I remember I was fishing on the bank and I, and I, and, and I was twitching it just like I had read in Bassmaster magazine, like That's you were talking about. Yep. And, and, the, and a two and a half pounder came up and swallowed it. And it was like the very first fish that I caught on purpose, you know, totally <laughs> magic, right. I can, I did it at a farm pond locally that I had to sneak on to it was Duckett's farm pond. And it was, a, mm. it was a kind of a slick day. And I remember reading about the cadences and how to do the, and, you know, mix up your, your cadence. And it was really interesting that, you know, I'd go back the next day after I caught that first couple fish, you know, doing it like they said in Bassmasters, but changing it up and just had a day. They wanted it slow some days, fast the other days. You had to mix it up. Super erratic. Um, man, it was just magic. And that's what got me started too. Crazy. It is crazy. We have Lord the same beat. 1938. Both of you guys Rapalas and and uh mine was actually Epic Eric Peak Lucid, get this, a Bagley Diving B1. Wow. At Lake Shelbyville in southern central Illinois, whatever you want to call it, at the dam, bouncing it off a, a rip rap. And it was in an LB4 color, Epic Eric. That's little bass on white. Hold and on. I know you're digging. I know you're digging. <laughs> Let's see that's that. Not, it's not. It's not bass, but I got the. I got the that, diving that's, B1. that's what's that? A uh, DC DC nine? No, no, that's a uh, uh, LG nine. All right, I couldn't come up with the bass color for you quick, but that's oh, I'm that's showing, a, that's, the, showing the peeps. I'm showing the peeps. Continue. That, that, uh, and and that was it. I remember winding that thing uh, and knocking it off the rip rap by the dam at Lake mm. Shelbyville. Probably nine years old. Um, Wow. I remember the combo, man. I had a Bantam Magnum Light 5.6 medium action pistol grip rod and a, and a Bantam Mag 100 reel. I mean, that's what I'm talking about. Dude, I remember it vividly. And here's the deal. I want to tell you something crazy, Pete Glusick. This is how amazing bass fishing is and the mystery of it. I can remember the cast. And the cast was just to the right of a napkin floating by the dam. <laughs> Okay, there was a napkin floating at the dam, and I sailed that that diving B1, cranked it down on that five and a half foot pistol grip, boom. And it was like something told me throw by the napkin, even though it was like, you know, common sense, there's something throw at it, you know. But man, I could remember it and just loading up, loading up, man. And, and, and hard baits. Uh, and and now, now keep in mind, I actually worked for Bagley's before I really caught a fish on a hard bait, <laughs> quite wow. frankly. So uh, I had quite a collection of lures um, before uh, before I even caught one on it. So Incredible. At, at 10 years old. So yeah, uh, yeah. that's the first one. But. I, that, that's, a, that's an amazing story. We all, uh, you know, remember those fish that were so impactful in getting us started in this game. And you, you, uh, you, were you guys around when, were you guys, you guys were fishing, I guess, when, when this all went down, when the, the big O was, was such a, that was the deal. Like that was a little bit like I, the big O was kind of, when I got into fishing, it was kind of, you know, they had moved on. Like the Bagley's was the big square bill and, uh, things had changed, but I, you know, that, that big O really, uh, it, it won a lot of tournaments and, and was, was really the starter of a lot of things in fishing. Absolutely. I think it started the whole alphabet crankbait plug phase, really. I mean, 1960, big O, um, <laughs> carving up those balsa crankbaits. The square bill craze was started by the big O. Would, would you agree, Pat? I 100%. Mean, that's, that is the predecessor to the modern uh, square bill crankbait is the big O, sir, right there. It's not a, it's not an original balsa, but you know, shake that Eric. Let me hear it. Yeah. Listen, listen, it's, it's butyrate plastic, which is a little bit softer 
than the plastic I have today. It's a lead ball in there. Can you guys hear that? Sexy. I can. Yep. Yeah. It's got yep. it's got like more of a base, a, a not quite as tinny. Yep. You're, you're exactly right, Pete. Does anybody know what the O in Big O stands for? Oprah Winfrey. Oh. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew she bass fish? That's crazy. <laughs> no. Sorry, the Big O. Blasphemous, actually, sorry for the blasphemy, Bex. Fred Young named the Big O after his brother Otis. Otis. Yep. Yeah. Who was six foot five, and so that <laughs> they go. So there you go, little little crankbait history for you. Yeah, you and you, know, you you know what's a crazy uh, bait? I mean, if we're if we're going in uh, uh, off in uh, in in tangents here, um, that's very similar in, that I pull out when it's that sound needed. Eric, yeah, is that uh, that lucky craft one knocker? Oh yeah, it seems to. In that 2.5 size. Yeah, Brent Ayler, mate, he had that whole Brent Ayler version one knocker. Got a few on the wall over here. Dynamite bait seems to get a bigger bite, bigger bodied crankbait, um, for sure. But but do you agree? Does it kind of sound like that old big old? It does. It okay. does. You know, I mean, I'll pull out the Brent Ayler one knocker, and it and I think it does. Gotcha. It's spot on, man. Uh, prior to the uh, to those. Well, there's some big square bills out now. Like Strike King came out with that monster. Monster one? Uh, yeah. The yeah. Or whatever. Or the, yeah. It's just, just a colossal one. But prior to that, the big daddy was the uh, the big N. Yeah. Uh, a oh, Norman yeah. crankbait. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Sure was. Right? That that big N yep. was a moneymaker for me uh, for quite a while. And it had a, it had a subdued knocker in it as well yep it does yeah. you're huge right huge price it's very similar yeah it's very similar to that to both the baits we're discussing right now that but and but you know i found myself myself more often than not going to the silent craig bait i mean whether it's a plastic one whether it's a wood one i i'm drawn to that that silent crank bait more often than one with a rattle or a knocker just because i believe crank baits displace a ton of water as it is and they make a lot of sound, man. Let's let's face it; those hooks clanking and the split rings. Uh, you've heard them underwater, Pete. You know what it does. I they they make a. You're right, and uh, I'll be honest with you, Pat. I have to agree. I, I find you know shape and displacement are probably the big priority. I like silent and noise. I like them both. I mix it up, you know, to trigger fish when, you know, when they get accustomed to. Uh, to a certain noise, we'll throw, I'll throw a different vibration, a different sound in there to keep them biting. Uh, they both have their, their place. Uh, but I, you know, I love those silent baits, you know, too. And, you know, one, one of the square bills I throw a lot now is Rapala makes a, a, a great, uh, DT fat square bill, which is, a, is just a terrific big presence in the water and, uh, just a, a really nice square bill. I use it a lot down on the Chesapeake. Oh, there you go. Okay. And, um, you know that's is that uh that brat one pete no, no the brat the brat is a real shallow um kind of a smaller scale down uh square bill it's a, really a, it's a terrific fish catcher um but it's a incredibly durable bait but it's and, it, and a really good fish catcher use that one too what's it what's but i just find depends on the size of the bait that they're eating you know i mean i'll go from you know really small finesse style all the way up to those giant ones if those big gizzard shads or the big herring are up or how about uh, the white perch in the spring pete i mean that's when i tend to score in that bds three or four throwing that on riprap when the <laughs> birds come in man you really get a bigger bite a lot of people yeah. focus on the 1.5 to the exclusion of those bigger body baits and i think they're You're missing right. a big bite Ike had an amazing finish down in your neck of the woods on the potomac uh yep. doing that exact thing uh, he was seeing the big gizzard shads or a big something jumping out of the water uh, up in Broad Creek, and um, and went to the, he found the biggest square bills he could he had yeah. in his possession, and uh, and and he was able to get in there and, and get those bigger fish. So, you know, it, it's that's a match the hatch kind of thing. But don't sleep on those big ones, those no. those big giant square bills. They can get it done. Yep, and um. Cl Clon so, has a new one that's out. 
now i don't know if you got did you hear about that one eric it's uh yeah what's that going to be called that's i read an article about he's not produced it yet right it's it's on its way well i saw there's a whole color chart and everything else what's the name of the company they make those hooks too that are uh, oh japanese company yeah uh it's man i don't know Toyota. think of it <laughs> <laughs> yes it's uh no they're they're an amazing they look amazing and clun has it's a big crankbait as pete's discussing that like that giant um strike king or the one like uh like you had there eric this is that skeet reese lucky craft i mean yeah dude that that's a monster that crankbait, you know look at that that dwarfs the big o, <laughs> makes it like that's o but right? think about it that's a small piece of bait man i mean a bat a little bass a little bluegill that size you guys know it there's no question bigger baits sometimes when it's right gets get a bigger bite no question about it but we're too many afraid times. of them we as fishermen as bass fishermen i think are more afraid of them than we need to be yep Agreed. and it's and it, a lot of times what we get involved in is it, the bite gets tough and we have a, a tendency to downsize and <laughs> And that is the right way to go sometimes, but a lot of times you got to go the other way and you, you've got to get big to, you know, bring those fish out of their comfort zone or match the hatch and, and type of bait that's around and they're not responding to your baits because you don't have the right size. So you, a lot of times you go, you got to go the other way. You got to, you got to go big or go home. Right. Right on, man. Well, tell me, tell me about field testing in the early years. What were, what kind of baits were they throwing at you? To well, get out there and, and give them some feedback on. It, it was pretty cool because um, I, as I kind of indicated earlier, I spent a lot of time on Lake Shelbyville with my with my grandpa. Um, and that's kind of where I learned to bass fish. So I would order baits according, according to my trips that I would be taking. Uh, because a lot of the lakes that were around the house were, were kind of weedy and I really couldn't crank them, uh, quite frankly. Um, at, at the time that I had access to, you know, little ponds and stuff like that. So it wasn't really crankbait friendly as much. Um, so I would order baits or get baits sent to me per my request for my trips to Lake Shelbyville. So I would, you know, get an assortment of, of square bills or an assortment of, uh, of DB ones or DB threes. And, uh, and my grandpa and I would go to Lake Shelbyville. And I would write reports and send them back to Jim Bagley and Wayne Davis. So Man. little ten-year-old uh, kid reports going to to Jim Bagley, <laughs> like with a number two pencil on, on a yellow <laughs> sheet of lined yeah. paper. No, they had Bagley had God, and I wish I had. Do you them. have any of those field tests? Oh, well, maybe oh, my, maybe oh, my man. mom does, but but uh, they they were actual sheets that you filled out, and you know, wow. bait model number color style wow. conditions lake you know the Crazy. whole deal and you send them back in man do and, you have yep. any of the baits left in that box that you used to field test with right there <laughs> that's your grandpa's box right oh yeah i i got a bunch of them man and um oh, wow. you know I, I mean a lot of the baits i've had since i was a kid and and and, and quite frankly every bagley bait in my grandpa's box he got from me but uh, <laughs> so it's not your grandpa's box yeah, yeah grandpa loved grandpa. me yeah. grandpa always pete grandpa always reminded me i was having a conversation with fighter the other day about this grandpa always reminded me how much every bass cost him that i caught okay <laughs> how, much, how much every bet but pat yep. That bass cost me seventeen dollars and thirty seven cents. You know, by, by the time he put gas in, yeah, it, fuel and yep, fishing <laughs> license and you name it, sandwiches, he charged you for everything. Dude, that's that was the deal. So he, you know, and a lot of people might cringe at this, but, but Grandpa liked to uh, like to eat those fish, you know, and uh, and not me, not me. Huh? Get some release. Bye, buddy. Hey, and, Pat, uh, did you did you notice when you went out to field test as you started to accumulate these baits from Bagley's that one might be very special? I, and I did you get tuned into the knowledge that there are special makes of those particular baits, like one bait at that age? I, I sure did. And let me tell you how I found out how um, naively, uh, or is that a word, uh, sure. that, I, that I found out? Um, you, as you know, 
that a lot of times you would get Bagley Bates back in the day and they just wouldn't do anything. Like, mm. like you could throw it and it would just go flip or <laughs> sure. I mean, that that's what it was. But then there were certain ones that you would get and they would be completely straight. But yeah. then you would get other ones that would do just crazy things. Yeah. You know, they would they yeah. would puke and jive and then they'd wail and then they'd hunt and they'd go back and round and they'd do an S and they'd zig and they'd zag. And 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 that was the magic of those balsa baits, man. Great way to way to bring that out, Epic mm-hmm. here. Because man, like we hear it said by all these greats, and I'm sure one of the greats that's coming up right here uh, oh, will, will tell that. us that no piece of wood is the same man uh, man some wood blanks can weigh three times as, as much as another isn't that crazy same yeah. balsa size same and, and each bait is not going to be exactly the same lip angle so many different factors crazy imagine the frustration of lee having to deal with that in production like bagley's putting this stuff out in the massive scale because they're doing hundreds of thousands of baits at yeah. a time or more yeah. and you know the balsas you know like you said it's different densities different weights and it's going to change everything but you got to you got to try to make them as consistent as possible we'll we'll ask him that question we're going to have him on here in just a second guys listening at home uh if you want to get your question asked on bash university get over and subscribe to bash university tv it's free 30 days use the code bash you live 30 and come check it out we have over 700 instructional seminars from the best anglers in the world teaching about what they're really talented at. And it's it's an extremely valuable resource. We think you'll like it. That's why we're giving it to you free for 30 days. So go check it out. And if we use your question live on the air, we're going to give you something cool from Bass University. And speaking of that, Riz, we have, a, we have anybody in the queue that, uh, that has some crankbait questions for us? That's right, Pete. We sure do. And uh, the first question is going to come from uh, Little Buck Three, and he wants to know: um, Are there different hooks on your crankbaits that you will use when targeting specific species? So, if you're targeting smallmouth over largemouth over spotted bass, are you using different types of hooks on your crank and plugs? Well, I, I, I'll come out of the gate on that, and uh, I've. I've converted my crankbait hooks over to that EWG style. That hook um, has been the most consistent fish catcher for me across the board. And I don't, I don't mess with it. Um, it gets them in the boat. There are, there's some cool VMC has a, a cool new uh, like hybrid treble hook that I'm very interested in working with and uh, seeing how that affects my strike to catch ratio. But that's what it's all about for me guys it's strike to catch, you know, and, and everybody's rod reel line is different and it responds differently to hook sets like, uh, Eric and Pat and BTC, Riz, everybody, everybody's going to set the hook a little different. Uh, they're longer, they're leaner, they're shorter arms, you know, and, you know, so what you got to really pay attention to is your strike to catch ratio. And for me, that's the hook that has really impacted me and, and helped me a lot. So what about you guys? What, what, what are you guys using? I'll, uh, I'll talk a little bit about it. I, I, I mix it up, Pete. So on this flat A, which was one of my favorite flat side baits um, from Bomber, um, I use an EWG on the bottom hook. And I think it's important for people when you're changing out your trebles on how to do it properly. There's one side of the hook that will keep that hook point on the bottom straight. And that's how you want to put it on. Um, and then on the back, I'll use a round bend and treble. And the reason I'm using a round bend on the back is if the fish are slashing at the bait, I feel like I've got more of a chance to get a hook in them. And then during when I'm trying to reel that fish in, maybe I can get that second hook in them. So I use, I'm trying to go best of both worlds. Round bed for slashing baits, EWG for holding power. I'm a Gamakatsu fan, but I think I know the, the VMC hook you're talking about and it's got my interest too. It's an inline treble. Is that the one you're talking about or is it a brand new hook? Because maybe you, you've got something new. Yeah, well, it's a brand new hook that's coming out on, a, I see a lot on the crankbaits. Like I, uh, Defoe's is OG flat side yeah. has that crankbait hook on it. And I'm most impressed with its holding power when I jammed it into my forefinger when I was cleaning <laughs> my office the other day. You guys may have seen okay. that. 
<laughs> I've removed that hook on uh, on Facebook or, or Instagram. You guys can go check it out. So it has it has tremendous holding power. So it caught my interest. Interesting. <laughs> Good stuff. <laughs> Pat, you you want to weigh in on travel hooks? Man, I uh, I'm going to tell you that these days I throw whatever comes on the bait. Uh, Factory and- hook, steady retrieve. Yeah, <laughs> um, I mean, uh, <laughs> but, uh, it, you know, the thing is that I think a lot of the baits come with quality hooks uh, that I use already. Um, and I, I like the bait that I, I use the Berkeley hard baits. I use the Lucky Craft hard baits. I use Iris C hard baits uh, and they all are uh, balsa baits. They all come with uh, with good hooks that plain and simple. So I, I don't mess with that anymore. I quit fishing tournaments because I just kept cashing them second places, you know. Oh, oh, not too shabby. Oh, not too shabby. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but when 100 Gs are on the line for Pete, man, he's Nothing got to have the it. best of I'm heart. talking third three-boat derbs, buddy. I'm talking second in three-boat derbs, so you don't <laughs> yeah. mess with me. I hear you. You, you, you throw the taco. <laughs> but as far as triple well, hooks, man, um, I, I, I like where you're coming from on there, and I actually have a question for you, Epic Eric. Do you do that on all your baits or just that flat style? Are you going no. you, your combo doing, on everything? I'm doing it for all the baits. Like I'll mix in EWG and round bend because if I feel they're slashing, I feel like I I can get that round bend hook point in them. And, you know, it's a treble hook bait. I'm going to have a chance to another hook to, to, to get into that fish during the, you know, when I'm reeling them in, unless they're totally skin hooked on one tine of the treble. But uh, you've probably seen on TV where the Bass Pros try to get another hook in them. That's a difficult thing to do. But, yeah, I like to mix them up, man. So I do it on all my baits. The, uh, my, my favorite, though, is like that combination round bend O'Shag Nasty. You know what I mean? Yeah. That, uh, yeah. that uh, O'Shag Hennessy. Type O'Shag thing. Hennessy. I thought yes. it was O'Shaughnessy. Uh, no, it's O'Shag <laughs> Hennessy. Uh, you, it, it, you know what I'm saying, it, Tim Othey? Hey, but, Pete. Last, it's fascinating right. that the opinions on trebles are so varied. And God, I was just out with KVD, and and of course he's a Mustad guy, and and he's yeah. using those Mustad, you know, kind of EWG styles, and he that's Great his go to. And, and I'm I'm in on board with that kind of thinking. And Ike is all round bend almost all the time. Wow. So it's it, yeah, it's, it, you got guys got to check out your strike to catch ratio. And right. if you're miss, missing fish, start making some of these adjustments. There you go. Pete. We're going to take a quick break, guys, mm-hmm. and uh, get your questions. We've we've got you know one of the most powerful forces in the world of crankbait fishing that is going to be on our show, and we're going to be talking to him. You guys are going to be talking to him. He's going to be right back here with us, Lee Sisson. One minute. In one minute. One minute. We're going to take this quick in commercial one, break. One minute. We'll be right. One back. minute. We'll be right back with Bashy Live. One thing that's happened that's probably advanced our electronics more so this year than anything that has in a while, C clear power wiring harness. These units are designed to do a certain thing. If you're not getting enough power, enough wattage, enough voltage, they're not gonna perform the way they're supposed to perform. C clear power wiring harness fixes that problem. One of the great things about the C clear power harness is it doesn't matter what brand of unit you have, it doesn't matter what kind of boat you got. The thing that you want from the C clear harness is power. Sea Clear Power puts enough voltage to your units to make them maintain the performance that they're supposed to maintain. So if you're not seeing everything like you think you should see it, Sea Clear Power will show it to you. And we're back. back we are back, Pete. Bash it. Welcome back. Welcome back, guys. Um, we are, uh, you know, very excited uh, about tonight's show because we've got somebody that's that's impacted the sport of fishing uh, as much as anybody in the in the history of the sport. He's, he's been a major major player, and um, and I see him now uh, popping up on the on the Zoom call and and. And I'm so pleased to have him. He's uh, he's done more in the world of crankbait fishing than virtually anybody in the last uh, 50 years. And uh, we're going to be asking him questions and talking to him all about this stuff. We invite you guys to do it. But I, I see him here. He's the great Lee Sis- Sisson. Great to have you with us, buddy. Thanks for coming on the show. Yeah. Hey, listen, I, I, 
I appreciate you guys having me. I, I kind of thought everybody forgot about me by now. <laughs> <laughs> you changed the game. You changed the game. You, uh, I mean, your, your claim to fame is you took that shallow water crankbait and you made it go deep. You figured out how to do it. That was an a, a amazing effort. Well, I was fishing a lake. I was fishing. I was living in Baton Rouge, and I was fishing a lake called False River. And they had all these brush piles out at the end of all these docks right in uh, about 15 feet of water. And you could go out there and catch plenty of fish on worms or jigs or stuff, but there just wasn't anything to get down there. So I wanted a crankbait. I could get down there and fool, kept fooling around with it until finally I came up with one, which became the DB3. Wow. That, that, there it is. There, there's, a, there's a prime example. And uh, just uh, to introduce the room, Lee, we've got uh, we've got some crankbait aficionados. Uh, one of your former uh, probably uh, employees uh, with Pat Renwick from Straycast is with us. Hi, Lee. Uh, we've got Epic. Epic Eric is one of the our our crankbait phenom lore collectors. You know, passionate about crankbaits. Epic Eric is Hi, here Lee. with us tonight. Great to have you and, on. Uh, and well, of listen, course, you I'm, talk I'm, with. I'm tickled to be here. <laughs> and of course, you've talked with BTC Brian the Carpenter. And uh, off screen, you can't see is Riz. <laughs> that's that's Rich Lead Beater. He's going to be handling our IMs. He's going to be feeding you questions uh, from our uh, subscribers at Bass University. So, uh, so yeah, we're we're tickled uh, tickled to have you. I you know you you started tinkering with lures you know right out of the gate. Um, but man, how how did you like? I was thinking about this when we were going to have you on tonight. Like, man, it must have been a complicated procedure. Like, how did you figure out, okay, a, a longer bill is going to make that bait run deeper? Let me just try getting more length on there. How did you How did you come up with that process? Well, it's a lot of trial and error. You know, back, back when I first started, you know, you built a whole lot of them before you ever got one that, that ran right. In fact, the very first diving bait I made, was about the ugliest lure you've ever seen because I thought that the lip had to be supported. So I ran the wood out underneath the lip out to where the eye was. So it looked like it was mad all the time because it had this big chunk of <laughs> wood sticking out. And then finally I realized I didn't need that. But you know, it was, I was, I, was, I got to fish in that lake I was telling about Falls River. And, and, and I, 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 I can imagine every, guy that ever got in the tackle business starts off like this. You know, I, I go out there and I win a couple of tournaments on it. Now I'm the only one that's got a crankbait that goes deeper than about six feet. Wow. And so I was doing pretty good. And then all of a sudden, one of the, one of my co-anglers says, man, can I borrow one of those? And you, you know, you bow up and you go, Hey man, somebody else wants to fish with it. All right. And then, you know, a little bit later he's, you know, he's, he's, Somebody comes up and says, can I have one? And, you know, and you give them some because you're just proud that somebody wants to fish with it. Next thing you know, somebody says, I'll give you some money for it, and you're in the bait business. <laughs> That's a, did, did, did you ever have any regrets, like, when, when, you, when they, you gave those baits away and, and uh, suddenly you weren't winning as many tournaments and, and they were winning them now? Well, no, I – I never did because, you know, I was always just real pleased that somebody wanted to use something that I built, you know, yeah. you know and to this day, it's the same way, you know? Oh yeah. There is a great satisfaction with that. So I got a question. How did you get the originals? I think I read something where you were putting bell sinkers on original models. And then when did the lead get into the lip? Was that something you did in replacement to the bell sinker? What was the no, originally that lake I was trying to, what I would do is I'd take a sinker and put it just on the line. And then oh. I would, I would let it go down and I'd let it float back up and I'd kind of jig it backwards, you know, to, to get it down there. And that just wasn't as effective as I wanted it to be. <laughs> That's a lot of work, Lee. That's a lot it, of it work. It was, it was. Yeah. I caught fish that way, but it, it you know, it's funny because I've taken a um, – one of the things that I've done is I've taken a regular crankbait and have put an eye just under the lip of it, and I attach a piece of wire that's maybe six inches long and put a weight on it. 
And on some of the lures that I've, I have built, I can, I can do the same thing. Now I can, I can make a crankbait go as deep as you want to, because it's got this piece of lead that will sink it, but it hangs out underneath the lip and it doesn't affect the action. And it'll just run across the bottom and, you know, 20, 30, 40 feet of water. Wow. I've got some buddies that have used it smallmouth fishing yeah, and, and have really done well on it. But yeah, it's just not something we're ever working on. Down deep, I mean, you look at the size of this 10XD, 6XD, they're monster crankbaits. They are. They there's are. probably some magic, and they wear you out. There's probably some magic being able to get a small bait to that depth. Well, what a lot of people don't realize, you know, they think you can just put a big lip in a little bait and make it work, but the the lip is just part of the diving plane. It has to have something to work against, and that's the rest of that body. And that's why you have those big old body baits that, you know, to get them down deeper. So we were talking about how some baits have some magic in them. And did you notice like as a builder and on the production line, like, did you have a special box? Where, like you figured out, okay, this one, hunts. At, you know, it's really funny that you, that you say that, <laughs> you know, while I was doing all this, I was still doing a lot of fishing. Yeah. And so I would, I'd go to these tournaments, you know, doing promotions and everybody would want to get into my box. So I started carrying a box where I just take the lures right out of the package and put it in the box because wow. all the guys were taking my good lures. The sand so I'd pull out that box yes. as, as my tackle yeah. box and let them dig through it. That's amazing. That's awesome. So you did know, you knew Lee, the good ones. Listen, there. I remember one time, you know, now I was at Bagley's. We were building up to 25,000 lures a day. Wow. Oh, wow. And if, and if I couldn't go pick one out, I could build it. But every so often you'd get one that would have that just right vibration, just that right, just that swing, that just right feel, whatever it was. I remember swimming down uh, to get a DB3 one time, and I'm thinking, if I get hooked up on this thing, I'm going to be in trouble. <laughs> but, I, you know, I would go down and get it if I had to. Holy, holy but, man. Hey, but, Lee, what? What other baits besides the DB3 are you responsible for at Bagley's? Um, when I got to Bagley's, they had the um, BB4. They had all the, the Bangalores. They had the BB4 and the uh, BB3. And pretty much everything past that all the way through the small fry series. So, you know, the killer bees and honey bees. And, oh, wow. Um, Man. The small fry series was was probably the most the prettiest thing the best thing that we worked on as far as as um you know the 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 actual cosmetics of it we, we there were there was some really pretty lures we were we were making the um the brim small five brim i think is the prettiest lure that we ever made sure in the pumpkin seed remember that one the, the oh. pumpkin seed yeah that was a oh that was gorgeous lee well it's funny you mentioned pumpkin seed because I'm thinking, okay, we have done something that nobody else has ever done. You know, it's just, you know, it's just, that's it. You know, we, we I finally accomplished something that, you know, that nobody else has done. Then I'm going through a tackle show in, in Atlanta one time and they had an antique lure collection and there was a um, head and bait called a pumpkin seed. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And, Metal and lip. it has a metal lip, but it's almost the same shape. I mean, it looked so much like it. They didn't have the ability to do the pad flex printing, but it was still the same lure. And I go, okay, I give, you know. Most lures are just um, improvements on things that have come before. It, man, sure. and Lee, I, I want to tell you something. The uh, the small fry series, it, it changed uh, it changed the game for a lot of us. I, I know that's a big word, game changer, but... Mm -hmm. I want to show you something here, Lee, and and you're you're not. I, I don't know if you listened to the beginning of the show or not, but um, as a as a ten year old kid, uh, Mr. Bagley and Wayne Davis um, used to bring myself and my family down to Winter Haven. Uh huh. And um and you were the gentleman that was my guide um through the factory on on a couple occasions, and I was a little mop top, little blonde haired kid <laughs> uh, 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 running through, and uh, and I want to show you a bait, uh, Lee Sisson that um was given to me and you used to give me just a cardboard box man you and you'd t take what you want pat you you didn't care and you'd be like that's a good one that's a good one that's a good one <laughs> and i didn't know i didn't know lee but you changed my life and you're very influential in my life and i need you to know that 
And here, right here, Lee Sisson is a is a Bagley small fry crawdad. And I'm getting, uh-huh. I'm getting worked up, man, because I've caught I've caught a lot of fish on this bait in my life. A lot. And I call it the craw shizzle. It's the uh it's Mr. Hanky, actually. <laughs> Mr. Hanky. Yeah. Yes, sir. And it's a it's a very it's it's a, a unique uh shallow running small fry crawdad because it's got the round bill and the very small round bill. Uh-huh. I know a lot of times you switched up bills in there, Lee, during production. Uh, the bills kind of varied in size. And this one has the most incredible thump. And it is the most fish catching machine ever. It's got 50 things of nail polish and Sharpie and, and fake pin and eyes. And it's Mr. Hanky. And it's caught a lot of fish. Thank you, Lisa, and for being such an influence in my life. I just want to let you know that. Luckily, if you snag that one up, you only have to go shallow to get it, right? No, it's it's retired. It's retired, Lee. It's retired. I wanted to show the small fry that you were talking about, pumpkin seed and the baby bass. I mean, are those works of art. How how did how was the printing done? You know, I know some guys that during the spawn, that bait right there, lead and lip, is a killer, uh, a bed bait. It just aggravates them and they'll they'll put a little sinker on it to get it down in the bed and let it float up and then jam it down in the bed repeatedly and a bass just cannot handle it there's a little bed fishing technique for you with the bag of small fry how was it printed you you mentioned a process i'm curious there's a um can y'all hear me oh yeah okay there's it's called pad flex printing and it's a it's a a um soft pad that that picks up a uh, picks up the ink out of an etching. So you do the etching of whatever you want to you, whatever you want to put on the lure, and that pad picks it up and then moves over. And when it pushes down, it just goes all the way around the the lure. Wow! And it places that ink you know on the lure where you want it. That's extraordinary. I mean, the finishes on those for the day. There was oh, nothing there, that can match that. I mean, that's you walk into a tackle store and you see that bait on the shelf. You had to have it. You had to have it. Well, There's we no- hoped you had to. We tried real hard <laughs> to make you have to have it. <laughs> oh, well, we- Pat, Pat, that was a great story about how Lee influenced you. Oh. And uh, Lee, I know I, I was reading some some backstory on your stuff and. Uh, you had a obviously a major influence on your life is is the day when Mr. Bagley came walking into your store. <laughs> um, you know, can uh, can you tell tell me what you know what that was like and and how much that's meant to you over your career? Well, that that did change my life. I was I was building these lures. I had started building them and I was selling a few at some of the tackle stores. And I was running a recreation complex. I'd been out of college for about a year. And I was running a recreation complex in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Um, this fellow that was running it, guy by the name of Bob Aikenhead, he he was running the, the tackle department in this store. And he had sent some of these lures to a couple of the different um manufacturers. He, I know he'd sent them to Bill Norman and to Bagley's and, and to a couple of other places. Well, he asked, he, he told me one day, he says, Jim's coming to town for a tackle show. He said he wanted, he wanted to know if, if he could talk to you for a minute. And so, man, I'm just all bowed up and I'm just, <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. And so I go over and we start talking and we we're kind of in the back of the, you know, back, back in one of the back rooms. And uh, we talked for about 10 minutes. And he says, um, you want to go to work for me? And I mean, right out of the blue. <laughs> and, and I say, sure. He says, don't you have to ask you, your wife? And I said, no. I said, I've been telling him I was moving to Winter Haven for a year. <laughs> you know, and, and, and really, I talk, this is truly a dream come true. Because I, you know, I had joked about it with my parents and with my, with my wife, never thinking that it would happen. And then he says, well, well, how much are you making right now? And I told him, he says, well, I'll double it. And I get up off the floor again and brush myself off. (laughs) (laughs) Bagley was a baller. There's no doubt. And, um, and the rest is history. I was uh, two weeks later, I was in Winter Haven, Florida, building fishing lures. Man, that's incredible. 
pretty cool. what was it what was it like uh, from he was a great mentor uh it seemed like a great motivator of people uh what what was it like working for him you know i i played football in high school and i played football in college and both of them we had a we had a high we had a state championship um team in high school and a national championship team um in college jim was the best coach i ever had you know wow. he was he was able to get the most out of every guy you you did it because you didn't want to you, you did whatever it was whatever it took to make it work because you didn't want to let the rest of the guys down Man. um jim put together what i considered a championship team That's he, awesome. he, he was he did and, and what and how about what i remember as a kid about about jim bagley lee is like he he was that dude when you walked into a room like it was just you were looking at him no matter what even if he wasn't talking well, he he just he knew how to he he just knew how to uh, communicate with people. You know, all those guys. We're talking about Lou Childry and Cotton Cordell, um, Bill Norman, um, Ray Scott, Forrest Woods. All those guys were almost identical. They they. Um, we're almost carnival barkers. We go to a tackle show. Hey, buddy, come over here. Let me show you what I got. Just step right up. You know, um, one of the stories I heard about Lou Children, and I don't know if this is true or not, he, he had been stationed right after the war. He was stationed in Japan and saw that they were able to straighten bamboo and to temper it. And if you notice, you know, a lot of bamboo, you see these little burn spots. Well, that, that's, how they, that's how they do that. Well, I was told that he started importing cane poles. You know, he came back after he, after he got out of the service. He came back and started importing cane poles. And the story I heard was he didn't have a car, so he'd take the poles and lead them against the bus and then go up and reach out the window and hold the poles from stop to stop out the window of the bus until he got there, until he got started. <laughs> I don't know if that's the truth or not, but it's a good story. Heck yeah, it's a good story. It's <laughs> From Lou's Reel, from, yeah, from man. Lou's company. is. I remember is, the speed was, stick. That was one of my favorite rides, man. Heck speed yeah. stick. Well, you know, Lou Lou came back. Jim and, and Lou were good friends, so I got to hang around with him a lot. Um, Lou came back one time and from one of his trips over there, and he, tried, he, he brought back ceramic guides and pistol grip handles and real light rods, and he was trying to sell all this he tried to sell it to some of the major rod manufacturers and they said, no, they, they weren't interested. And so he just decided to do it himself. And, wow. um, he started importing that stuff and, and pretty much changed the, the rod and reel business because mm. back, you know, y'all may not remember it. I'm old enough to remember that rods and reel rods were, were, were really heavy and reels mm. were too. And he did this thing. He called it palming. You know, <laughs> and I'm going, Palman, what do you mean, Palman? You know, nobody will ever do that. Yeah, right. <laughs> hey, hey, Lee, do you rem I remember in Jim Bagley's office, speaking of pistol grips, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, you, you may or may not remember this, but he actually had a hand-carved wooden pistol grip rod with the original Lou Childry Shimano reel on it. Do you, do you oh, wow. that rod? I'm 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 sure he did. Like I said, they were buddies. Now, now they were buddies, but they were always trying to, you know, pick at each other, just like you know guys do. First time I ever went, I went to the first. Um, it was called AFMA back then, but I went to the first tackle show, and it was in Chicago. And this Lou, is the predecessor it, to ICAST. What's that? This is the predecessor to ICAST. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Yep. And I, and I go up and, and Jim's introducing me to all these guys and he introduces me to Lou Children. And this is when Lou was just, he was, he was introducing the speed stick and the speed spool. And, um, we got to talking and, and Lou finally, he picks up a reel. Now Jim doesn't have one of these reels yet. And he picks up this reel. And he says, you like that reel? He says, I says, yeah. He says, well, it's yours. And Jim just looked at me, but the only, I know the only reason that I got that real was he was just trying to get it back at Jim, you know, just get over <laughs> on Jim. 
<laughs> well, um, Ken Duke is a good friend of ours, and he's he's one of the reasons that we're connected with you tonight, and we want to thank him for, uh, you know, um, suggesting that we give you a call, and we're awful glad we did. But he caught, Ken has a question, and he wants you to tell about the uh, – the sod truck, uh, Jim Bagley story. Oh, Jim, that, that's that's one of my f- favorite. Jim, Jim Bagley, and and that was one of the things it, you almost look forward to going to work every day because you just never knew it was going to happen. We had a bunch of Wayne Davis, like like you talked about, and Cliff Shelby, the guy that used to draw all the Harry and Charlie stuff. Yeah, um, all these guys worked there, and it it, it was it was a pleasure to go to work and Jim just, Jim had one of the quickest minds and, and humorous minds. One day we're going down the road and the side truck passes us. There's a bunch of side farms down here. And it's, you know, it's an 18 wheeler full of side. And Jim looks at me and says, that's how rich I want to get. And I look at him and go, man, you want to own a side farm? What? I said, what are you talking about? He says, I want to be rich enough to send my grass out to have it mowed. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, but he was, he was able to do that just constantly, you know, just. <laughs> he, he was always razzing Bill Dance, too. I remember working sports shows with, with Jim Bagley and Bill Dance, and he was constantly at Bill Dance, just picking at him. He even made a DB3 once, I remember, Lee, that said, Roland dance on it. <laughs> oh, could you imagine if that DB3 wow. was around somewhere that was the Roland dance signature series and it was in an in an H690T. Remember yeah. that one. Well, you know, you know <laughs> You know that's that's another one. I was I was really fortunate enough to get into it when I did and was able to see some of the guys that really made this industry what it is today. Um, it's it, you know, back then all these guys were, they were the, the, the guy, the driving force behind the, behind the industry. Um, you know, I mean, listen, our industry, we got a great industry now, you know, but it's, it's a core, it's a corporate operation that back then it was, it was just fun. There was a guy by the name of Joe Hughes that worked for uh, Rebel. And a lot of the tackle shows, I'd be standing there in my Bagley's get up. <laughs> and he'd be standing there in his Rebel get up. Now, these are in-store promotions. And we would bet lunch on who could sell more of the other guy's stuff. Wow. <laughs> so so they'd come in and I'd try to sell him a Rebel and he'd try to sell him a Bagley. And there was a really confused customer there. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all. Oh, Joe, Joe Hughes. We both had it. We both had um, back then. You know, the uh, custom vans were big. We both had one. Now, and I don't know if this. Here's another story. I I can't verify, but it's what I heard. They both of our vans got kind of old because we were traveling all over the country in them, and they kept trying to get Joe to get a new van, and he kept kept selling, saying no, no, no. The story I heard was they sent him on a trip and crushed his van while he was gone. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that ain't playing. No, Man. they wanted him to have a new one. <laughs> <laughs> I got what, what is about, uh, uh, oh, Pete, go ahead. No, go take your turn, Eric. What do you got? What All do right. you got for Lee? I, 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 I want to get back to the bait. I, I've got a question. <laughs> about, I, I'm just dying to know. Like, So I've got a, a, a question about the Biddy B first. Uh-oh. The Biddy B. Is, is that which movie? one? The Biddy B. Bagley oh, man. B. Okay. It's a tiny one. What was the origin of that little bait? Who's Who thought my buddy won on the Potomac River, final day with Mark Menendez, throwing the Biddy B, black back silver foil, he won a ranger on it. It is a dynamite bait for river systems. It just gets bit. The vibration on this little thing. Well, it, st- it started off being a honeybee. That's right. If, y- if y'all don't remember that or not. Yes. And then there was there was a um, a um, conflict of the name, and so we had to change it to the bitty bee. Okay. <laughs> It was just, you know, I just, I was just, listen, most of the baits I built or, you know, that we built, I, I built for, you know, for me to go fishing, really. 
Right. You're a bass fisherman. And first. it just happens that somebody else wanted to use it. But I was looking for a smaller bait. You know, there's times when they're chasing those little bitty bait fish. That's right. And so I was looking, for, I was wanting to build a bait that was real small or small, small enough that you could still cast it, but yeah. you know, it'd have a small profile and have a small um, signature in the water. It does. Yeah, nothing, just, just a smaller vibrant. bait. Yeah. And uh, the, the shallow runner was, was easy. I say easy. I mean, it was, you know, it, it didn't take too long. The deep diver was a real booger. And we had a, um, about a 97% out of the box would run true. Hmm. The best I could get on the, on the, um, diving bitty B was about 87%. And, you know, I kept telling Jim, we can't make it. I just, you know, I, I'm having, you know, I, and I worked on it, worked on it, worked on it, and could not get it any better. And the smaller the bait, the harder it is to get to run right. The bigger the bait, the easier it is. That's fascinating. So you're saying out of the 10 that I have in my box right here, only eight are going to run right. <laughs> no, it probably will, but but <laughs> it, it won't be the water. Don't worry. You, you can you can always adjust it. I know you know. I know. How. It's a numbers you're game. Right. Absolutely. Anyway, Jim, Jim goes to a tackle show. Yeah. Comes back with an order for a hundred thousand of them, and he says, "Now we got to build it." Oh my goodness! Oh my <laughs> yeah, you better. So we started building. I mean, we and 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 you know, it never did get up to our normal ninety-seven percent uh, standards, but sure, sure, we did the best we could. And, so now and, I got a question on the paint. I got a question on the paint. This is my last question on just the technical piece of the bait. It seems to me that the phosphorescence back in the day, in the seventies, I've put newer Bagley baits and newer baits that are custom painted or and or painted in a factory under a black light in the old Bagley's glow 4X, what the newer ones do. There is so much more phosphorescent going on. Are the, were the paints different? Well, what we did was we worked with a, um, it was a lure company. I mean, it was a paint company called Delta Labs up in Ocala, Florida. Okay. And we developed a lot of the paints with them, um, we, we, we perfected a process of getting the fluorescence into the paints mm -hmm. because you couldn't just dump the, it, we, we used day glow powder, um, and you couldn't just dump it into it. It just wouldn't work. You had to, you had to make a paste. You had to mix it into us to some certain chemicals, make a paste and then put that into the paint. And then it would work. And so we got the people from, from Delta Labs to come down and work with us. And we developed we developed those paints. And, and they, they really did glow a lot better. We developed a two-part urethane mm. that sticks pretty good. Back in the old, when, we, when I first went to work there, we had problems with the paint wanting to peel off. We were using a one-part moisture cure urethane. And it just... It just didn't hold up as, as much as we wanted it to. And we got to working with um, Delta Labs and uh, they they were using it, it's a it was a two part urethane that they manufactured to put on gymnasium floors. Wow. And yeah. we we did some um, we put like a UV um filter in it to help it keep from yellowing. You know, a lot of lures will yellow over age and, and so will ours, but you put it, you put a UV filter in it that, cause UV is what causes it to yellow. Sure. Uh, you know, and, but, but we, we were real fortunate to get able to be able to work with Delta labs. And we ended up, you know, after I left Bagley's, I, uh, the Delta labs salesman was a good friend of mine and I helped him get into a, a whole lot of other places. But I know, I know, Delta Labs uh, went out of business, I don't know, 10 years ago. So that's probably why you're not seeing the fluorescence the way they, the way they used to be. Yeah, Pete, it's like the JJ's magic of, you know, crankbait. Right? <laughs> you know that stuff works, Pete. That's why those OG baits, man, catch them so dang good. Well, you know, you, you can't just go out. You can't go down to like um, – I'll say Sears, but nobody knows what a Sears is anymore. <laughs> but you, you, can't, you, you can't go to Walmart and buy a bait machine. No. You know? 
wow. we, we had to develop all the, all the equipment, all the machinery, everything was developed, actually developed, you know, there at Bagley's. The, the uh, now I'm not everything like the pad fret printing. That was, that was something that we were able to purchase off the shelf. Okay. We had to adapt it to, to, you know, you know, make it work in our, in our systems. But, um, for the most part, we had, we had some really sharp guys at Bagley's that, um, were able to, you know, do things that, you know, that you would have thought was, was impossible to do. Incredible. Well, the this is the KB2. Is this one of? I don't know if you can see it on your screen, but I, I've one. lost the picture. I'm, I'm not seeing anything from y'all, so I'm hoping I'm looking good. You look amazing. Very, very handsome. The uh, <laughs> the 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 KB2 and the DKB2 is, uh -huh. is, are are those baits that you know are under your umbrella? Yeah. In fact. Up until the small fry series, most of those baits I had, I had, I, no, I didn't have the bitty bee, but most of those I was building while I was still in Baton Rouge, the killer bees and the, wow. and the diving bees and the, and the, um, it's kind of funny the way the BB2 and the BB1 came along, our machines screwed up and just shortened them and spit those out. And we said, let's put a <laughs> lip in them and see what happens. Oh, <laughs> what the heck? Wow. Uh, wow. That, Lee. There's your clip of the week right there, Carpenter. That is. I love it. It's a happy mistake. And, and you probably know this story, talking about the invention of the rattling bait. I didn't know this until recently, but there were these Cordell spots that they were making. Exactly. Like, right? Exactly. And they sent them out to a tackle distributor, and the tackle distributor called up and said, well, your spots, because it was a fixed lead weight, it was non-rattling, but the weight came loose. And the Actually, it, it was... Um... You know who it was? It was either Bobby or Billy Murray. Yep. Were fit, was fishing a tournament and called in and said, man, I need some more of those baits. And he said, he said, well, we're having problems. Some of the weights are, are, are loose and they're rattling. He says, yeah, that's the ones we need. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's funny because. Happy accidents. We all, all of us that, that do the design work like to take credit for everything, but there's an awful lot of things that were just mistakes. <laughs> that, um, you know, that's light. Yeah, the fish light. I've got a question about your ticker, your ticker, your sisson ticker. I'm holding it up for people at home. Yeah, but me this, too. This rattle in here is very unique. What is that rattle made out of? I, I rumor had it was a 22 caliber shell with a with a steel ball, but maybe yours wasn't. It sounds like it. Some of the That's, old bait makers would do it. I actually had I actually had some some brass caps made, but that would be a really close. Um, if if you had to just guess at something, that would be really close. I had I had the tickers actually made. Okay, but, but they're made they're made like a like a twenty two shell would be made. It's super unique. I mean, it's not a one knocker deep lead sound. It's not a high pitch BB sound. It's just like you said, a ticker. And it seems to be unique. I mean, I know people. Well, one, of, one of the things that I've, that I've, I think that, that all of us are, are missing is uh, the sound vibration. All that's really the same thing. Sure. Sound is just vibration in the water. Um, a fish has, you know, one olfactory sense and one's visual sense, but he has three ways of picking up vibrations. And so, you know, God doesn't make many mistakes. I figured this probably three times as important. The um, <laughs> one of the things back and in, in back when I was, was in college, I was fishing Toledo Bend a lot, and they used to have these giant schools of of uh, shad swimming around. And then all of a sudden, you see these bass blow up on it. Well, one day I'm running down the lake, and there's this giant school of shad, and I'm kind of hot, so I jump off in it. And right in the middle of it. You know, first thing is I hear is all this ticking sound, just like just like what that rattle makes. Wow. And have you ever seen on television where they show, like, tunas chasing bait fish? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's exactly what started to happen. I got these bass chasing these bait fish all around me. Well, hey, Lee, Lee, can I stop you for, for just one second? You sure. said You said you were a little hot, so you just jumped in with the shad. Is that what you said? I just jumped in. 
jumped in the water. <laughs> He's jumped in the water. Just like well, yeah, that. that's what we, that, that's what we used to do. Clay to Ben, it would get hot. <laughs> he did. Okay. What was really funny? You think that's funny? They owned a stick steering boat. You know, and forty miles an hour back then was fast. I'd jump in from the front end going forty miles an hour, and the guy in the back's panicking. You're insane. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, so you jumped in the water to to listen to the sound? Well, I didn't necessarily. I didn't know about the sound. I didn't really jump in to listen to the sound. I jumped in to just to see what was going on, and I noticed the sound. Okay. But it's, if you listen, it's the same sound that crawfish make. Now, growing up in Louisiana, I listened to a lot of crawfish in the bucket right before they got hot. Yeah, bud. Ah. Yeah. yeah. It's that same ticking sound. Okay. Yeah. Let me story. ask you about the vibration because the the one of the big keys to some of the baits like this, you know, mm-hmm. this bag would be is the thump. Now we're talking about sound and and vibra- and vibration how they're the same, but these baits that the the KB series have a huge presence in the water. Monster. There's thump, 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 thump. There's thump. nothing like it, Pete. There's nothing like it still to this day, Lee. There's no other crankbait that 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 can match that. The um, I had a a test tank, IRS test tank in my backyard. It had a it had a real springy uh, casting platform <laughs> on it. Uh, yeah, a, di- a diving board. <laughs> <laughs> but one time, well, it's it's actually my ex wife now. But one time, my ex wife comes home. And I'm sitting in the pool with a snorkel. I'm sitting on a concrete block with a concrete block across my lap. And I'm with my hands sticking out of the water. And I'm casting and retrieving lures because I'm listening and be, listening, basically feeling, but listening to the to the way each one of them, um, the noise that they make. And, you know, Bagley's never had sound chambers in it, but they made a lot of noise coming through the water. Sure did. Um, yeah. There's uh, all that when I when I used to do my my seminars. There's there's several st- strike stimuli that um, I believe you know are real important to catching to catching fish. Um, the first strike stimuli is is the vibration or the sound because they'll feel that long before they ever get to you. And either that turns them on or off, you know, they can run from it or they might, they might get interested. And then there's a flash pattern and that's the colors or the, the shine, or depending on the, on how dirty the water is, um, the colors or the shine or, or whatever. And, and then it becomes visual, um, the visual senses, uh, with crankbaits, there, there's not really an olfactory sense because it's, you know, they're moving too fast and a good lure well, let's say that let's say that that all of the strike stimuli are be between one and ten on a number line. Well, all lures will fit in there somewhere, but a good lure will span more of that that you know that number line may go from one to eight or three to seven. You know where uh, a, a, a lure that's that's not quite as good will you know will have less of a attraction with its with its strike stimuli. Interesting. That's that's way over my head. I, I'm like, that's that's crazy. It can't be over your head. You know how to zoom. <laughs> <laughs> science, please. This in it's science. Yeah. Ooh, I, I've got a question for you. Do you know a gentleman with the initial CJ? CJ. CJ. He would modify your baits. Calvin Johnson. Man, the name sounds familiar. You're gonna have to you have to give me some more information. Remember, I'm old. I'm I'm from the '70s. <laughs> he would take, he would take your baits, and he would put that 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 ticker in it. It uh-huh. sounds just like that ticker. It's probably brass and some type of form of a you know ball bearing, and he would drill out the side, and and that's where that brass rattle would go. He would also uh-huh. make lip modifications. So he really did a lot with DB threes in particular. Um, you know, killer B twos. I mean, he, he very brave to like saw out a lip and change lips and and mix and match. So making bait mods is just a whole nother. There's a there's guys out there that have the guts to do it. I would never be able to saw out a lip on a crankbait and, and glue it in and understand lip angle 
Well, you and feel pain when you touch when you modify crankbaits. Yeah. You feel pain. I know you, Epic Eric. It's like oh hard. man, I'll paint them, but I won't. I I won't modify them like that. <laughs> Listen, so, I want to talk about lip angle. How did you understand how to get lip angle correct? How many tries did it take to get that killer B two DK killer B two that Pete's talking about and loves so much? How'd you get it right? How many? How long? In the in the beginning, it took a long time. I built a lot of lures that didn't work. Interesting. Um, there was there there is an old um, story again. I'm gonna I'm gonna screw it up, but it was when Edison was inventing the light bulb. <laughs> you all know the story. Yeah. No, but it has yeah. funny. Well, there was a guy came in and he a guy was doing an interview on him and. They were going through his workshop, and he's got all these light bulbs that hadn't worked. He says, man, how, how many have you done? And he said, well, I've done 563, um, and I'm, I'm, I think I'm getting close. He says, you mean you got 563 that don't work? He says, don't you feel like you're wasting your time? He says, nope, I know 563 ways it won't work now. Wow. <laughs> and that's kind of the way I felt with the – with the lures yeah. in the beginning, wow. trial and error. But after you after you do it a little while, you, you just get a feel for it, and you know, you know, lip placement, eye placement, lip angles, all that. Um, depending on what you want to, you know, you're talking about the killer bee with the hard thump. Well, yeah. that's why that lip is 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 down on an angle so much versus a DB three. It's almost straight out. A DB three's got almost a quiver. It's got a lot tighter. Uh, wobble to it. Yep. The um, but if you just move the eye down and not change the angle, but just move it down on the body just a little bit, that will change it also. That's incredible. Um, in and out, the um, the placement of the eye in the lip itself, all those are really, really important. Um, is that why you use brass to be able to tune a bait and to make it do things? I mean, I, you know, I. You know, obviously, tuna bait make it go left or right. To, to, but is that why brass was used instead of? Well, steel? in the beginning, we used brass because that's what they used on the Bangalores. They had they had, they had this brass wire, okay. and the brass they used brass because they would the that Bangalore had a harness in it and it was soldered, and right. so you could solder it. Uh -huh. We used we used brass for a long time, and then we found out that the brass and the glues that we use. Uh, we're interacting, and and if you know some of the black brass wires will break fairly easy. That's because it, there was a corrosion factor. So we went to an anneal stainless. Anneal stainless is a, is a softer stainless, and you want that softer wire so you can tune it. Okay. Uh, and I, I'm I'm sure all y'all know this trick, but I always I always wanted to be able to tune a lure to make it to make it run wrong. When you're fishing docks, for instance, ah, yeah. I'll have one that runs a little bit to the left, and then I will fish the front. And as I go by, I'll fish the, um, I'll throw down that one side, and it runs up underneath the dock, and it'll run around every post as it comes back out. Love it. And then I, I, I let the, I let the co-angler think I'm being a nice guy, and, and I give him the other <laughs> side. <laughs> <laughs> sneak, sneak, sissing. Unless he's unless he's Epic Eric or Pat Renwick, and then they're going to tune their bait to run left. Exactly. Right. <laughs> then, then you move out farther. <laughs> hey, hey, Lee Sisson, what the heck is Jellutong? Jellutong, it's a really good wood for making making uh, lures. Uh, balsa, balsa worked real well and there is a mistake about balsa mm -hmm. that that will probably you know always be around it was a it was a wood that that um fred young used it was a wood that that rapala used but jelly tongue is almost as light as balsa it's a lot tougher than balsa and it's a member of the rubber tree family so it has latex in it, which helps keep it from absorbing water so it won't swell up and crack and do a lot of things that other woods do. Uh, we were we started using we were gonna make some big lures for saltwater fishing and for musky fishing. 
and we knew that the that the balsa wouldn't hold up. So we were going to make it out of this wood called basswood at first, and we made a bunch of lures out of it, and found out that as soon as they got water in them, they swole up really bad and just cracked wide open. So we had to start looking for a different a different wood, and this jelly tongue was was uh, what we came up with. It was still a real light wood. It was a lot tougher. And um, it do it wouldn't it wouldn't swell up when it got wet. Massive. What's up? Why do people not use it now? Well, I mean, where did Jelly Tongue go? Well, there's a couple of things. It got hard to get. Um, but Jim did an excellent job of selling people on balsa. You know, <laughs> and <laughs> and listen, I tried. Yeah, I, and I built I built a lot of lures out of Jelly Tongue, and I built a lot of good lures out of Jelly Tongue. Sure did, but people, there's still that that balsa mystique about it. Is and is balsa trying to get premium balsa today at as easy as it was back then? I hear custom bait makers, I know a few, and they complain about it. It's harder and harder to get the best. What's balsa. happened is they started using balsa, making all those big old um, windmill things. You know the Oh, what? The, yeah, the, they use the balsa in those blades. You're kidding me. The ones on the highway? Yeah, the giant ones. The, you know, the, 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 the uh, generators. The, yeah. the huge ones, Pat. They're all over. The alien power ones. Uh, yeah. Pat, go yeah. steal one of those blades and let's get uh, Lee to make some crankbaits, man. <laughs> <laughs> 10,000 crankbaits out of one freaking blade. Hey, Brian the Carpenter's got Lee Sisson's number now. So, uh, Lee, expect some crazy calls. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Lee, we got a blade. Yeah. We're sending it. <laughs> Lee, Lee is doing a lot more fishing, and not not. I'm still building a few baits, but um, I'm playing more than anything. You know what happens is is I'll get in a situation where I want to do something. I I built a spinner bait down here that is is really working good for up for me. Tell us about it. It's a um, I don't I. I can't see, so I'm gonna hold it up. Can y'all see that? Yes, sir. Loud and clear. Yeah, man. It's got it's got twin blades on it, and then it's got this funny little bend right here. Yeah. I was trying to get a bait down on Okeechobee. You get a lot of sh you get shad spawns, which you get all over the place, but they get up in in what we call Kissimmee grass. Yeah. And I was trying to get something that would have little bitty blades because you know they're small they're small baits in the shad spawn and but but a lot of bling and something that would come through that grass and this is what i came up with oh, i love it um these see this is on a pivot so you know it can pivot away when the fish hits it yeah but it, it doesn't you know it doesn't prevent it but what it does do is when it starts to come over a limb or something you see how it rolls at the yeah. hook point away wood so yeah, you can man. So it's it it will fish, it'll fish through brush, it'll fish through um, what we call buggy whips down here. Yeah, it's yeah. just standing everywhere. As long as there's none laying over sideways, you can throw it right up in the middle of that, and it just kind of walks right out of it. I'd like to place an order for twenty four. Yes, uh, yes, <laughs> I got my well, order in first, so don't even try. You know how you know how you hate to fish um, the lily pads. You know the ones with the forks yeah. in it because everything oh, yeah. gets in it. Yes. Oh, yeah. Right in, right the, in the crotch every right time. In the middle. This Y for some reason just opens it up. Oh wow! No kidding. You have to pull a little harder. That's my but, new. But it, you know, and so again, it was a it was a bait I built. You know, I built as a purpose, uh, and I'm catching a lot of fish on it. I've got, I've got a couple of companies that that might that might end up building. So y'all y'all do have a chance of getting some. Hey Lee, I, I want to ask you since you are pretty much the uh, the living legend of crankbait designers and king. The only reason I'm a living legend is because everybody else died. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, Doctor <laughs> Crankenstein! Hey, yeah, you everybody, are. That, this is Doctor Crankenstein. It, he, it that sure is, is man. Name. He's hey. the father of deep cranking. Are you kidding me, Lee? What is your combo? For, for fishing crankbait oh. these days, rod and reel combination, rod reel line, the whole deal. I want to know shallow. Well, and I I've been a fan of of loose since he gave me that first reel, so I'm still using a lot of the loose stuff, even though even though he's been gone for a long time. Um, wow. He was he was a great guy, 
And so I still use, I use their, their pro model, you know, the top of the line lose equipment and, and it's excellent equipment. And it's, it sounds like a commercial and it's priced right. Um, so I use, a, I use their stuff. I use gamma fishing line. Oh man. Yes. Because oh, gamma is a expensive line, but it's a real good, um, uh, fluorocarbon. Uh, I was around when they brought out all those fluorocarbons that didn't work prime. I don't know if y'all remember any of that, but, um, and Gamma just, they, they built one. It's got a little more stretch in it. Their, their technology is, is a little different and it's got a little more stretch. And I, I like to stretch. I like a little stretch in it. Um, and. Do you what, use glass that? or graphite? Like, are you glass or graphite on there, Lee? What's that? Do you use glass or graphite for your crankbaits? I use graphite. You know, I know, I know a lot of guys went back and was talking about glass and everything. When graphite first came out, everybody was talking about how good it was for worm fish. And I'm going, uh, uh-uh. I can feel every stick I come over. I can pull it up and hang it on a limb before it comes on over with a crankbait. I, yeah, I liked, I liked the graphite for that because I can tell more. Okay. Um, if I want a for more forgiving rod, then I just go to a lighter rod, but, um, I liked, I, I liked, the uh, um, the graphite cause I like I like to be able to feel the stuff. And that's one of the reasons I like the fluorocarbon because you have more feel. Well, now I tried using, I tried using braid and that stuff will shake you to death. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I, went back, I went back to the fluorocarbon. David Fritz apparently is cranking with nothing but braid, but I want to get back to you and what pound test gamma are you throwing? I know I use gamma. It's a little thicker than most diameter wise. So you can step it down. So for everyday cranking, what's your go-to pound gamma? Well, in gamma line, they will have, if you've ever looked at the charts, yeah. their 12 pound line breaks at like 16. It does. Yeah. No doubt. You know, about so, that. so you got to remember that even though it's a little bit larger for that pound test, you're getting more strength. You know, the, the real pound test is, is, is bigger. Yep. So, but I, my rule of thumb is I always go as light as I feel like I can get away with. Sure. I use a lot of 10 pound line. Um, I right. use most, okay. most of my cranking is done on 12 pound line. Okay. Uh, one of the, it's, it's funny. I live in Florida where everybody flips and throws worms. My fa- one of my favorite lures down here is a shaky head. And I use a lot of 10 pound line <laughs> That's what I was with a shaky about. head. That shaky head, I use that spot remover with that flat spot on it. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. And you just drag it across the sh- you, the bottom, and you can find all the shell oh, down because shell bars are, are big down here. They didn't. People are finally starting to find out about them, but um, they are. There's a lot of fish hang out there, and with that with that flat bottom, that that edge catches on the catches on the shell. So you can feel it and you can not only find the shell, but you can find the sweet spots in the shell. And that's where the, that's where the fish hang out. So tell us more. Like, you're, you're, <laughs> you're, you're, ta- you're, you're talking, you're talking to an elite series competitor. Yeah, man. Here, guys. I mean, uh, that was, that must've been amazing uh, qualifying for the elites and uh, competing out on the top level. You know, <laughs> I, I have been very blessed in my life. And, and that was just, that was just another instance. I had just sold a company. I had a little bit of extra money, so I was willing to take a gamble. Um, I knew that shot would never come around again. I had just, when I sold my company, I had a three-year contract with Yakima, the company that bought mine. Um, that contract had just ended. I find myself with nothing to do. Um, I, I fished the I fished the opens for two years, and qualified. I, I in fact I was I started fishing the um, the elites when they back when they had co anglers, and I, I I really enjoyed just because it was interesting to get around those guys as as a as a competitor instead of as a sponsor. You know that was I really enjoyed that the, the bunch of bunch of good guys out there on on the on those trails. And I really enjoyed it, but then they told me I couldn't do it anymore. And so one of them, you know, and I'm, I'm complaining about it at the last one. And I'm, and one of them says, well, just go out and qualify and come back and fish with us. And 
So the next year I went out and qualified and I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> so you jumped from the co-angler spot into the pro side. It was amazing. Guys try to qualify for the elite for a decade to try That's to what get I said. I was just, I was just lucky. Um, there's another little lure that I made that I called the dingleberry. <laughs> oh, I had that on a, on a fluke, dude. Oh, exactly. Exactly. Oh, well, no. Let me tell well, you, I go up. I go up, and at, 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 at the year that I was qualifying, that's what I caught a lot of my fish on was that lure. No, and way. I go up the first time, and he said, "What'd you catch him on?" I said, "I caught him on a dingleberry." He says, "Next," <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I, you know, right at the end, he said, "Okay, what'd you catch?" I caught it on a dingleberry. Now wait a minute, wait a minute, and I brought one up with me, and I showed it to. I, I showed him what it actually was, and and then yeah. he. One, you have one available. It's a sliding weight on an EWG hook, essentially, and it gives it action. Like I don't know how to describe it. What made you think of that? Well, man, I'd like to take credit for it, but I had a guy at church say that he was hanging um, um, tube weights, little bitty tube weights, on it. Okay. Yeah, and and making it work. And, it, and that worked, but it didn't look good, and it would hang up in the grass. So I, I changed the shape of it a little bit um, and made it, you know, where it would go on there and stay on there. Uh, and listen, that that thing will just catch fish. It, it does. It's, it's probably one of the most productive lures I ever made. If you just want to go out and catch fish and don't care about the size. Is it still being made? Um, Davis Lures was, was making some at a time, at the time. I don't yeah, know if he still is or not, hats, but I'm, I'm running low. So I'm, I, I, <laughs> Hey, Hey Lee. And I, I, I'm, I'm being selfish about this, but I got to ask you one more question. The, I remember you telling a story, um, when I was a kid about going tarpon fishing with Bill dance or, or forgive me, uh, Wayne Davis and Jim Bagley. And you guys were actually catching tarpon on DB threes. What? Yeah, listen, we we have we have we tarpon tarpon don't know those are bass baits. <laughs> <laughs> no, the tarpon we used to we used to get around um some of the some of the deeper um docks, uh phosphate docks and things down here and crank up tarpon and snook. I remember I went fishing with a one of our local snook fishermen that's really a good snook fisherman. And Zara Spook is a real good snook bait. And it's it, it that's about all he would throw. And I remember the first time we went fishing, we, we drifting through. The tide was, was coming in, and we were drifting through this area that had uh, – it was old phosphate docks, and all the, the docking was gone, just the pylons was left. And we drift through there, and he starts throwing that. Well, I don't know any better. I'm throwing a DB3. And we drift through there and brrr, up comes <laughs> about eight pounds. And he goes, first, before that, he says, you can't catch him on that. <laughs> and, and, but I didn't know any different, so I threw it. So we get, you know, by the time we get it in the boat and get all in tight, we drift it by. So he, he starts up and we drift back through there. Brrr, up comes a 10-pounder. And take it off and he's going, you can't catch him on that. <laughs> and we go back, whoop, up comes a 12 pounder. He's going, you got another one of those? <laughs> of course he did. <laughs> but yeah, you know, again, I was very fortunate to, to be able to have the, the, um, the job that I had, you know, and one of the things I want to do is thank all the guys, the, the anglers that bought off our products because it allowed me to have the life that I had. My mom, my mom used to, to the day she died, she always wanted to know when I was going to get a real job. Wow. You know, uh, it was, I, I had a real, a really good life um, because of that. But I was, I was fortunate because Jim, you know, I mean, we, I, we were selling product and everything, but we were always doing something different. One day, one, one time Wayne Davis went up, Wayne was kind of a sarcastic guy. He went up, he went up north and he came back. We were trying to get in the, into the walleye musky market. And he came back and said, uh, Jim asked him in one of our meetings, he said, well, well, how'd it do? How'd it do? He says, he said, oh, it's great up there. 
He says, and Jim says, Jim gets all excited, but Wayne goes, but not for anything we make. <laughs> <laughs> so we started building lures. You know, we built some musky lures. I, I, I went up to a musky tournament. I'd never seen a musky. I'd read everything I could about it, fish of a thousand cast and once in a lifetime mm -hmm. and all that. Right. And I built this giant crankbait, and it was a flat-sided crankbait that was eight inches long and had a big lip in it. Yes, sir. Holy moly. And I went up there and immediately broke the lip off of it because the water was cold, and this was a big body bait with, you know, with a real thin lip. But I noticed, and this is one of those things that I take credit for, but it was an accident. I noticed that that it just had a real nice glide to it because that's how they catch muskies. They use glide baits up there. and had this real nice glide where it would kind of turn up and lay back down, and then you hit it next time, and it would turn up the other way and then come back. So I um, fished that tournament and came out third. Now, I had never caught a muskie before. In fact, I had a, I ended up being a good friend of mine, but this guy comes up and he says, how you doing? I said, I don't know. I said, I got this fish in the boat. And I said, everything I read is muskies have stripes and northerns have spots. And this one doesn't have either. And he got up on the back of that skeeter. And back then it was a skeeter wrangler and, and the, the live wheel all, went all the way across the back. And I took the divider out so I could put a big fish in there, keep him alive. And this guy gets up there and he does this little dance around. He goes, that's a silver muskie. That's a silver muskie. What? Well, I won bass boats the next three or four years fishing muskies up there. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, <laughs> Never we got heard of a silver we, muskie. We got into the saltwater market. I wanted to do some saltwater fishing. And and Jim Jim loved the saltwater fish, but he was a an inshore fisherman, you know, snook and tarpon and redfish and trout and that kind of stuff. Well, I wanted to do some of the offshore stuff. And so I said, well, I think we ought to do that. Have at it. Go do what you want. You know, see what you can do. Well, I built, I, I went to all of the, all of the um, riders and boat captains trying to find out what they wanted in a Marlin lure. And they all, they all, you know, they all said exactly what they wanted, which basically came down to a lure that it, they call it smoke and it comes kind of catches comes up and catches air and it just leaves a long bubble trail behind it when you're trolling it and so i built a bait we called a head knocker and i don't know if y'all ever knew that knew about that one or not. yeah okay well the head knocker i built a tube that goes on the front of it and it has a little collar um on it so that tube would rattle it would press up against that and it would rattle and the it had a big end and a little end. So if you wanted to go slow and have a lot of motion, you put the big end out. And if you wanted to go slow and have a little motion, you put the other end out. And if you wanted to go fast, you put the other end, the smaller end out, and it would catch a lot of, but that, that, that tube, that tube that went over would also catch air and make it smoke real good. And so that was probably the most unique lure I ever built for, for being a, you know, a freshwater guy, because I didn't know what I was doing. But what, what I did find out is I went back, after we got it all done, I went back to all those riders and boat captains and said, I built a lure exactly like you wanted it. And every one of those riders took credit for it and wrote all kinds of stuff about it, and all the boat captains were pushing it. And we did pretty good with that for a while. <laughs> no matter the species, you seem to be able to be successful. It, it, it's an amazing career. Well, you know, one of the things I found out doing all that is fishing's fishing. You know, when we're bass fishing, I look for moving water and I look for a drop, maybe a six to eight foot drop. Musky fishing, we I fish the flowages there and I'd look for moving water and 10 or 15 feet of water, you know, or, or shallower. You go marlin fishing, you're looking for moving water. Mm -hmm. And you're looking for a drop. Moving water is the Gulf Stream, and the drop is eight eight hundred to a thousand feet. <laughs> but it's all the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, let me let me uh, take a moment here, and uh, it's is great. Really enjoying all the stories and learning so much about crankbait fishing, and uh, and I'll, I I want to throw it over a little bit to the Bash University uh, crew, and um, and Rich. 
I know you got a bunch of questions. We've been sitting on them, but we can't we can't ask them because we're having we're enjoying so much listening <laughs> to Lee uh, talk to us. So, uh, yeah. so I'll talk to y'all night. Y'all better y'all better be careful. <laughs> <laughs> we love I'll it, man. Stay on. We're, we're really enjoying it. And uh, guys, if you want to get a question through to tonight's show, be sure to use the code BULIVE30. Head over to bashu.tv forward slash live. Get your question through to the night, and we're going to be sending you crankbaits. But without any further ado, okay, getting jiggy on the message board would like to know, Lee, do you prefer a line tie directly to your crankbait, or do you like to use a split ring and or a snap? You have to use a split ring or a snap. I I use... I use the split rings on all my crankbaits. On some of my jerk baits, I use a very small snap um, that is made by owner. It's a little welded snap. It doesn't off, it doesn't give much weight and, and everything. If you tie directly to your line, I mean directly to the line tie, your knot will cinch down on it, and depending on if it's left or right, it'll cause the lure to run off um, either way, one of the ways. So you, you have to use some type of, something that allows it to turn. I, when I'm using a, a split ring, I always tie where the two pieces of wire come together. That's probably the weakest point on the split ring. But if you don't, then sometimes that split ring will hang up on the side of, that, of the, the wire that's in the lure, and it, that will cause the lure to run off. So um, you, you know, tie they're, in they're, the crevice? Is that what you're saying, Lee, that you, you're, you tie in the crevice? Where the you know where the where it's, I'm tying to a single wire where the other two wires come back together but don't touch. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. And and yeah. the reason I do that is because sometimes that the split ring will catch, just just catch a little bit on it, but it'll cause the lure to run run crazy. Right in the crotch. Boom. Yep. Lead us. <laughs> great great question, Riz. Hey, this one another. That was a good question. Yep. Yeah. And. Uh, Jay Hen on the message board. What's up, John Henning? He would like to know, Lee, currently, what is the best type of paint you can use on a crankbait for durability? That's a, that's a really good question. I'm, I'm struggling with that right now myself. I, I still paint some lures and, and stuff. Um, that urethane that I was telling you about that we developed. Now, I've been – I sold my business – 10 or 12 years ago, I've still got some very small jars that I can mix up. I'm, wow. I'm, hoarding, it. I'm hoarding it. Wow. Um, <laughs> because it is really hard to find something that, that sticks, that sticks as good as that does. A lot of the stuff, um, will, will want to peel off. There's, there's some, there's some, from what I understand, there's some waterborne urethanes or some moisture cure urethanes that um that are pretty good but i i really haven't tried any because i am sticking with that with that stuff now if you're if you're you know if you just just hand painting some um i will use and again depending on the lures i will use some of that flex coat that you put that you use on a rod and reel it's a two-part epoxy and i'll paint that on you know as thin as i can hmm. Uh, you can paint it on thicker and give it a better coat, but it may change the way the you know the shape of the body a little bit. Yep. Uh, but if you paint if you paint that on, then you've got to rotate it until it until it dries. Let me let me ask you this uh, question about that. You're you're in Winter Haven. It's humid as heck down there, and it does does that matter? Like where you, where you're painting or what materials you use based on where you're at. Yes, it does. We used to have real problems with that at Bagley's on real humid days because all of our all of our paints were lacquer based, and we used acetone, which is a which flashes off real fast. And you want that so when you're spraying through the mask or through the net or whatever, you know it dries almost instantly, so it doesn't smear when you remove it. But on real um, on real humid days. Because it flashes off so fast, it will it will uh, haze over, and then you have to you have to use a, a little bit slower, um, something like lacquer thinner that's got some ketones in it that that will slow it down a little bit. Um, I always we always liked lacquers because it was a real a 
a real fast drying material. But one of the problems with the lacquer is you want to put a, some type of urethane or epoxy over it. I know even today, everybody has thrown a, a plastic lure in with some worms and had it, had it just mess up, goo up. Well, the, um, that's the plasticizers in the worms that will react with, with a lot of the different paints and lacquers. It, w it will react with lacquers real bad. Urethanes are, are good about that. That's, that was one of the reasons that we always used urethanes was so it wouldn't, you know, back then the, you didn't have, you had a lot of lures that would mess up when you put worms in. Now, now there's, there's a lot of different coatings. They use a lot of uh, UV cure coatings that they run through a, a light tunnel and cure automatically and, yeah. and they don't mess up. But um, back then we were just starting to play with some of the UV cures back then. Oh, I remember. Oh my gosh. How many tackle boxes have yeah. been ruined? Yeah. You know, yeah. all those lures gummed up, the, the tackle boxes melting and, oh, that was a crazy problem for a while. You hey, know, Lee. You have that figured out. If you could only fish one color crankbait, uh -oh. what would it be? Man. Um, it would be. Chartreuse. No, it would be well, down here. It depends. See, it, it depends on where you are. Sh chartreuse, the fluorescence. If you're if you're in dirty water, like like when I was in Louisiana, it would have been chartreuse or or bright orange. All right. Um, in the cleaner waters, I like I like uh, some of the pearl patterns. Or um, Florida got a lot of a lot of um, golden shiners, so some of the goldish colors work real well. And mm -hmm. so really it, it, it's hard to, it's hard for me to say that it's one color, but if I had to pick one, it would be some type of, um, pearl pattern, um, sexy shad type thing or, a, G -S -H. or a Tennessee shad. Tennessee shad was, was always a really good color. While we're talking about colors, one of the things that, that I learned, actually I learned this when I was working at Yakima, mm -hmm. they wanted they were they used a lot of fluorescence in their in their and their salmon stuff, and they wanted to be able to put. They wanted to develop a a um, paint that had that had the fluorescence in it, but it was a clear. And and there was a there was a clear powder that was that was made by Dayglow, and so I've. I've I was able to use that same system that I was telling you about that we used to use <clears throat> to make the fluorescence. I was able to use that and put it into the urethane. But in doing that, I, I did a lot of research on what made, on what, you know, on the, on the um, fluorescence. <clears throat> Fluorescent, and they call it excited, which, which gives it, it's not really a glow, it's more of an aura, but, it, but it's excited by, by UV rays. UV rays is the second strongest ray that comes from the sun. X-ray is the strongest. And so what that does is that gives you more penetration into, in, into the water column. And, you know, if it's dirtier than, you know, it's not going to go as far, but it's going to go farther than, than the regular white light. And it, then it, it excites it. Have y'all ever, anybody's fish uh, fluorescent orange in Louisiana probably seen this, but, you, but you'll hold it just under the surface and there's like a little glow around it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, that's that, that's that, um, the UV rays are exciting that, um, that wow. thing. Now that all sounds, that all sounds real good. The problem with it, the UV rays also destroy fluorescence. Oh, wow. <laughs> you know, so eventually, eventually it will go bad. I developed, I ended up developing a, a, um, I call it Sisson secret sauce. And it was a, <laughs> a, um, a, a stuff that you would squirt on a worm and it had a scent in it and it had, but I, but I was able to get that, that clear, um, fluorescent stuff in it, you know, so it would give a worm just that, just that little bit of a, a bluish aura around it. And it, it it worked real while real good, and I had a I sold it for a while, and well, I I got I got to say, Lee, it sounds like you dodged Eric's one color question. Pretty good. <laughs> he did. <laughs> I'm glad. He got well, it. well it's, it's because there's not a good answer. 
<laughs> but I did say I did say that if I had to pick one, it would be one of the one of the pearlescent patterns, like a sexy shad, or actually, the old Tennessee old Tennessee shad to me was a really good color because it had that it had that it had some green and it. it had that gold across the back. Yeah. It was just a real pretty color. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of different uh, Tennessee shads too, Lee. There's a lot of variations of TS in the Bagley. That's for sure. Well, over the years, you know that, that it, it 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 has changed. You know that's, and and I hate to, I, I try not to be negative, but but there's there's been some changes that you know it just happens. It happens with everything. You're, you're not being negative. That's I mean that's that's great. Mm-hmm. What. What year did Bagley's go to crap? Let's just be plain and simple. What year did Bagley's Tell me how you really feel. Yeah. What year did the Bagley's become crappy? Let's cut the crap. You know, I, I really don't know. I left in 83. Um, it was 1983 when Lee left. No, I, I, don't, I don't. I wouldn't say that. But That's not true. But it, it wasn't long after that. I don't think they came out with the smooth. I don't want to have nothing to do with the smooth now. <laughs> <laughs> that was a topwater bait, right? That banana looking thing. Oh, that, that was that smooth? goofy little diver diving bait. Yeah, I like don't that. know what it was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> they, um, Riz, Riz, pull up the smooth. We need a, we need an image of this. Oh, it looks like sperm, Pete. It kind of like it, it reminded me of a flatfish. Yeah, whatever yeah. it was. Yeah, yeah, right. That's a great representation. A flatfish with a bill. Um, yeah. yeah. But no, I I you know, listen, you know, I was telling you that Jim was the best the best coach I ever had, and he put together a championship team. But just like all championship teams, time came to an end. Mm-hmm. You know. And there wasn't a whole lot. There wasn't a whole lot. Well, you know. Oh, we lost. We lost, Mister Sisson. Right at the gym. You want to? Jim back? We cut him off. But yeah, Jim didn't <laughs> want us to know all that. Uh, <laughs> above, I think. Jim, Jim from championship above. team. <laughs> championship team. Get him up, BTC. See if you can get him to get get back on. We'll um, do. Okay, but we'll. Uh, that was fun. <laughs> yeah, what a, what a bunch, man! Oh man, what what a life lived in this industry, and and you know mixing it up with all the gr- greats, and he's one of the greats. You know? Oh yeah, it's fascin- he, think fascinating. Think the stories stuff. that that like he's not telling. You know what I mean? Oh <laughs> my god, <gosh. laughs> that's, that's an Ike Live episode. I wonder how yeah. I wonder how many of those kind of stories we have. Dude, you know that like Tom Mann, Jim Bagley, Forrest Wood, Billy Dance, Lee Sisson, yeah. they they tore it up a bit. You know yeah. what I mean? Those guys were not afraid to partay. You I'm know guessing dead battery on the laptop. That's a guess. Uh, that's a guess. <laughs> yeah. Well, he, he, he stopped lost being video. able to see us at one point, so that means that it probably went into sleep mode, you know what I mean, <laughs> in like the first seven minutes of the uh... – <laughs> Dude, I'm blown away. Thanks, thanks, Brian the Carpenter, for bringing uh, Lee Sisson to us, dude. What yeah, a- and thanks thanks to, uh, to, to my spiritual leader, Ken Duke, for, uh, <laughs> for, for guiding thanks, me this Duke. direction. Oh. Great call! Yeah. What an add to the to the game tonight! Ooh, Unbelievable! You ain't kidding! Wow! Unbelievable! I forgot yeah. he made the dingleberry, Pete. I was on the upper bay struggling, slicked <laughs> off water, man, and I put the dingleberry on. And I told my partner, I looked at John Ingram, we're fishing our championship, <laughs> and I go, dude, I'm putting the dingleberry in the game. He goes, what? And dude, I started flipping it in grass clumps. It was like, tum, tum, tum. limited out, man. Limited out. Nothing huge. But a limit in the boat settles a man down and a team partner down in a big way. The dingleberry. I'm gonna have, man, I'm going to have a hard time throwing something called a dingleberry. <laughs> I'll throw it. I'll throw that thing. you got to put <laughs> sauce on the dingleberry, and then it's double X effective, man. I'm getting I, some of the spinnerbaits, man. That I, is a I wanna, Yeah, dude, for grass, come on. Come on, we got to end wood. And hey, professional fish head needs that spinner bait for his derby coming up if he gets in. That, you know, I, I'd be flat out honest with you because that was one of the blowback or blow my hair back moments of tonight's show. Uh, when because the like I asked JT Kenny to give a seminar on lily pads, yeah, uh, for Bash U, and 
we've done other stuff like that. And one of the biggest problems is you get caught in that crotch, that lily pad. Hey, like, how do you efficiently get through that? Is there any a chatterbait strategies? in there? Or... Socks, swim yeah. jig, socks, everything. He, he's socks. got he's got that dual bladed spinner bait is is coming through that stuff. Right about. Right in the crotch, Pete. It, yeah, just comes right through. Amazing through <laughs> the crotch. <Yeah>. Yep. <laughs> but that yeah that that was that was a pretty big moment and. Oh. Uh, I ordered. I hope we can get it back. Because I got a few more questions. Like, how many, how many major tournament wins are a result of of his work? Four classics. I wonder if he knows yeah, the that. Ricky Klun, uh, his buddy Ricky Klun won a few, didn't he, Pete? No, there's four classics attributed to Bagley's. Mm -hmm. That's a fact. Four yeah, classics. You got that? Well, we know. We know the uh, like. The, I'm thinking of the Takahiro, the uh, George Cochran. I knew it. Uh, Clun, um, Clun, Clun. Mm -hmm. What, which, which one did Clun win with a with a Bagley's? The uh, Honey Bee, sir. Before it became the Biddy Bee. Oh yeah, man. Clun no was kidding. throwing the Honey Bee. Yes, sir. That that yeah. had classic win on the box, I think, didn't it, Pat? Like yes, classic sir. winner. They would sure promote did. Like that. Sure did. And uh, there was an ad with Rick Clun, Rick Clun in a B, actually. Right, that, right that on. Was the predecessor to the Blind Melon video, actually. Rick Clun was in <laughs> Blind Melon. Hey, did you guys know? Here's a fact about freaking Lee Sisson. Guess who got him into bass fishing? He played football. Oh, I know. I know the answer to this question. You can't answer it. Pat, do you know this? I think I do, but I don't know the answer. I mean, I know the answer, but I can't remember the answer. BTC. <laughs> he hails from Pittsburgh. So oh, thank yeah. You. Yeah. Oh, Bradshaw. Terry Bradshaw. Terry Bradshaw yep. played football with Lee Sisson out there and, and got him, invited him to bass fish. How about and and that's how Bradshaw became friends with, with Jim Bagley and, and, and Bill Dance and, and all Isn't those guys. Crazy? Yep. Wow. The, here's, here's, here's the line. The Ken Duke says Bagley is responsible for five. Five? Okay. Five, five major five class five classics. Yeah. Five. Five major wins. Well, what's four eights? Ken Duke, what's five, the bait? I want to know the bait, Ken Duke. I know the I know the honey bee. I know yeah. the, uh, the balsa bee too. And what oh, are yeah. the, uh, what are the other the other uh baits, classic winning baits? I gotta know. Huh? DB three? DB three? Is there a DB three in there? It's I, don't, I don't know. I'm just I, I don't that does not a shell bed in Florida, maybe. I don't know. No, I, dude, the only baits, the only bagley baits I can think of. Um, are the uh, are, are the are, are the honey bee and the um and the other deal the the, yeah, the hero? Bee. What are they, Bry? I don't know, but Bradshaw's from Louisiana, not Pittsburgh. But he played no, in he Pittsburgh. Like, yeah. Pittsburgh. I know, I know. We're crying out, but hey, listen, Ken Ken dots the eyes and crosses the T's. All right. <laughs> all right, man. Oh, that's from Duke. Never mind. That's good. <laughs> I don't want a horse head in my bed, Mister Duke. Please. Hey, did did hey, you guys know that Bagley started out as a pork rind company? No, I yes. did not know that. Yeah, Jim Bagley okay. purchased like the Dean Pork Company in 1954. Yeah, and then I actually wow. have Bagley plastic worms called yeah. the, old, the old monster. Uh, before yep. before Zoom had the old monster, I also have Bagley switch blade spinner baits, which are oh, some, baby. some of the thinnest wired spinner baits you'll ever see in your life. And I also have structure spoons made by Bagley's called salty dog spoons that are made of lead that you can actually bend and they flutter in different directions on the fall. Right. Crazy. But do you have the Bagley Shiner? Oh yeah. Oh. I caught one of my biggest bass in the in, in the lake in front of my community on a Bagley Shiner. Yeah. How about that? And here's the deal Pete. we're talking about salt Golden water Shiner. Bait. The, the, the yeah. saltwater baits, that's one of the original Bagley saltwater baits. Yeah, because it was called the pinfish. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Really? Yep. Yes, sir. All right. I got something for you guys. What so you got? Ken Duke is uh, inside his computer right now. And yes. uh, 1974, the balsa bee. 1976, the honey bee. 1982, the DB3. 1986, DB3. And 2004, balsa B2. DB3. Pat, DB3. I remembered it, man. It was in the I brain. Don't, I don't. Talk to me. Okay, so It was on a shell bed somewhere. I don't know. Oh, hey, I mean, come on. Don't make me think. You guys ready to double down and do this again? Look, 
Lee, oh, look at you. Back to top water bait. Oh, yeah. Get Lee back here. Get Lee. Uh, here we go. You got all night, Bry. I mean, I, I could tell he's got all night. That's <laughs> <laughs> that kind of party, man. <laughs> he disappeared. Hang in there. Oh, shoot. <laughs> Stand by. Stand by, Stand please. By. <laughs> Who's throwing a dive in B3 in a Bassmaster Classic? What were the years again? Uh, 70s? No, 80. Hang in there. 74 was a balsa bee, 76 a honeybee, 82 and 86 were DB3s. 82 and 86. Not just one, but two. Two, one, 82 and 86. Yep. Help me out. I don't know. Where's Ryan Whitaker when I need him? And 04 Where's was Ken the Duke? balsa bee, too. Tell, tell I mean, Ken Duke to talk to us. We all know talk. I knew it. Yeah. And Rick Clun, 76. What's 82 and 86? What, who are those winners? Somebody help us out. Chat boy. It's on a shell bed. I'm telling you. Oh, it's it's got to be one of them. Cockburn's got to be uh, one. Oh. Okay. I'm guessing, but I, I can't imagine what that's like. Like, uh, Eric, when we were out and, and on uh, Pete's Quiet Killer, we were able to catch a fish. It, it was like, yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> the, the winner I, winning a was winning a Elias. Winning a classic? No chance, man. Elias was throwing a DP3. <laughs> hey, everybody, Pete Gluzik is a crankbait maker, too. Yeah, there Pete's it is. Killer. You see little there Pete? There it is. Bob Allen, crankbait maker behind the magic. And let me tell you something. Pete Kluzik with a quiet killer is a nasty dude. Bob Allen. Shout out to Bob Allen. Um, <laughs> may he rest in peace. He was one. He came from the North Carolina, you know, crankbait carver masters, you know, and, and built some amazing stuff over dude. the years. Such good ones, right? So we were, we were looking for 82 and 86. Is that correct? Uh, I got them. Okay. It, it's Elias in 82 and Charlie Reed in 86. Uh -huh. Charlie oh. Reed. Charlie. Okay. <laughs> Again, Curtis. Oh, Elias. Was the, the he wizard. kneeling and reeling? Was he kneeling and reeling? No, that was with a man's, right? That, that's what I thought. But I don't know. Got Who knows? Bob Ballin, may you rest in peace. Hot belly. <laughs> I met him at Denny's, and we talked crankbaiting for like two and a half hours. Pete, he delivered the quiet killers because I helped get the bills for him when you were first making them with him. And he showed yep. me a bunch of his original crankbaits, and, and I said, would you want to share some with me? And I said, I'm happy to pay you for your work, and he did. So I've got some really early models of the pot belly with that funky lip. Wow. I don't even know what material that lip is. Can anybody out there – in crankbait land, I, it's is it something to do? It's it's milky, and it's no, not like carta. It's a it's a coffin shape, but the pot belly lure uh, is 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 a crankbait that he used down at Lake Gaston to win a federation a divisional tournament down wow. there, and uh, he used it uh, to great success on the Potomac River, as it have I. Me and, too. Uh, and he is using. A uh, 22 shell with a BB yes. inside there. That's what you just right. heard. I just I just knocked that ticker. Could you guys hear that when I did it? Well, I have I have a handful of uh, of Bob Allen originals as well, and uh, it's great that? that the the these crankbait uh, craftsmen, uh, Craig oh. Powers, uh, is one that comes to mind in recent times. And he, he carved some crankbaits for me for, um, for quite a while. <laughs> and, uh, there's so many, uh, down in that Tennessee region so that are obsessed with, with, you know, with crafting these, you know, one of a kind really. Oklahoma as well in the Oklahoma area for square bills, dude, like, like mm -hmm. uh, uh, Epic Eric, you know, I think there's a sum behind you. I, I see, man, dude, these, I, I mean, again, not 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 a sponsor, not a plug for a plug, but it is a plug for a plug. These are the best damn balsa square bills that I've got in my hands on in ages. These Iris C's. Uh, un unreal, dude. Like, unreal. I I that's all I can say. They're that damn good. Out of Oklahoma? Who, what Oklahoma. company is that? It's called it's just a it's just a, a little private bait maker, Pete, and it's called yeah. Ira C. I R A letter C. And okay. I mean, I'm I'm telling you. These these are like the good Bagleys from back in the day. 
the the good ones we would search out. You know, the one out of the, <laughs> out of the six. Yep. You know what I'm you put, saying? You put the dot under the chin to make sure you know <laughs> that that's the one you don't give away or share. You know. Thank you, but, thank but you. But don't I, buy the blue Cephas color. Don't don't get that one. <laughs> Whatever you do, you don't get that color. You're not gonna like that crankbait, Dewey. Don't throw it. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, sorry, Richard. Show me the Lasifus color. Do it. Do it. I, I don't have it. I don't have it. All I, I just, I just ask for the basic stuff from Myra, and I have just like a an 09 chartreuse black back, and then a mm -hmm. a GSH, which is just a, a shad, a gray shad type color, Pete. And that's all I throw. Like if you have three yellow ones and three white ones, that's all you need. But look at Epic Eric right yeah. there, getting all sneaky. You see what he did? Yeah. Look, he's he's gonna show you, Pete. Oh, <laughs> yep. That's not. He is the uh, he is the old sneak sneak himself, Epic Eric. Yep, yep. <laughs> I see Lee up on. Uh, are Lee? Are you back with us? I don't see his picture. No, I see his name up here on Zoom, and I I didn't know if maybe he, we had him for audio. We are trying. Uh, yep, I understand. I, I think his strobe light ran out of batteries. <laughs> I was getting seizures. <laughs> hey, hey, Riz, do you, do you have any questions in the queue for the for the panel? Absolutely, uh, Pete. Fat Chris on the message board wants to know what's the go-to real speed when you're throwing a crankbait. Go-to real Ooh, speed question. for throwing a crankbait. Oh yeah. yeah okay. uh, Who's answering that? You want to, Pat? You go first. What are you, what are you throwing? Do, oh, there's Lee Sisson. Let's let Lee Sisson answer that. Lee, yeah. you hear him? Uh-oh. Uh -oh. He's muted. I, I see yeah. his lips moving. Lee, Lee, just move your lips and I'll answer the question. <laughs> 6. 6.8 to 1. <laughs> Thanks, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> Lee, if you can hear me, you're muted. So take your arrow on your mouse and hover it over your picture and you'll see this little button called mute. Click it. And he's still <laughs> muted, but that's okay. He's going to figure yeah. it out eventually because yeah. he's a playmaker. Hey, hey to, to answer your question, while while Lee's figuring that out, the you know I commonly do use that like six point eight to one, and I use that most of the time. And um, you know, I like to be able to speed up when I need to and slow down when I need to, so I keep it steady there. Uh, there are time I have the the low gear ratio reels for when I need to get extra deep, and I use them sparingly. Uh, extremely sparingly, you know, when you're, cause you, you know, sometimes you can over crank some of those, uh, you know, DT twenties and, uh, you want to get them super deep. Uh, and, and, you know, I do have those, but most of the time, man, I'm, I'm throwing that, that gear ratio. I do have actually some of the new lose tournament series reels, which I love. Uh, I love to lose reels. They're amazing reels. And I, and I have the high speed, you know, I think it's like 8.4 to 1 that I use when I need to burn, when I need to get that bait moving to, to trigger strikes. So, uh, yeah, you know, it really it. depends on the depth and the bait that you're using as far as how I choose my gear ratio. Uh, Lee, are you back with us? Nope. No, no, no audio yet on Mr. Sisson. We'll, uh, I'm working on it. Uh, yeah, well, uh, you guys might find this interesting. Uh, according to the great and powerful wizard of, of Duke, uh, PH Customs bought Lee's old machines, and they make a lot of the old Sisson balsa baits. Did you know that? In the old yeah. school line. In uh, the, I don't know if we already said that. Maybe we did. In the PH Custom Lures yeah. old school line. There's a lot of, you'll find a lot of the uh, old Lee, Lee Sisson shape. How about that? Yep. I did not know that. Yeah, well, you know, and, and I wanted to kind of ask Lee about that because – uh, Jim Bagley Great was question. such a mentor to him. And, you know, with PH Custom Lures, you know, is he looking to pass that torch and, and, and share that kind of wisdom and knowledge, you know, on uh, to PH Custom Lures and the guys that are building building those the, that stuff over there? I want to uh, ask Lee about handmade versus duplicator made there are very few crankbait makers making a true handmade 
crankbait. No machine. Yeah. Right here, bud. <laughs> Handmade. Yeah, well, it's the duplicator is something that I know Bob Allen was playing around with the duplicator and wanting to wanting to get that and um, you know. But the handmade stuff, boy, it's just it's oh, hear so me much yet? time, E. Oh yeah, we got you, Lee. Yeah, boy, back we're in. back. Welcome back, Mister Sisson. Get <laughs> it. We got Terry Bradshaw coming on in a minute to tell us how he got you into bass fishing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm getting a terrible picture, you guys. You're good though. We see you fine. Can you? Can you hear us okay, Lee? I, I that time I did. Okay. It, it, it looks like things are, are breaking up or something. Keep trying. Well, well, tell us tell us the story about Mister Bradshaw. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> Terry, Terry was. Um, I don't know what I can tell you that you don't already know, except that in in college. He was a pretty shy guy. He doesn't look shy at all now, does he? <laughs> no. But in, in college, he was he was all business. You know, I always I tell everybody that we helped each other um, in our careers because when I got to I, I had been doing some fishing, but I wasn't serious about fishing. And one of the first times that I really went fishing um, for real, bass fishing for real, was with Terry. He took me out on Lake called Lake Darbone up in uh, north north uh, Louisiana. And we got on a school of bass, and, man, from then on, I was hooked. But I tell everybody that we helped each other. You know, he taught me how to fish, and I taught him how to scramble. I was an offensive tackle. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that's Were funny. you the blindside tackle? I wasn't. Well, I, I, I played on both sides. I – Okay. I would go in on rotation. I never, I didn't get to play my senior year because I had Dane Bramage. But um, I uh, – just got that. I got did. That um, Dane Bramage. Oh. I got that. So I have so many lures. Um, I got Dane Bramage from playing football too. <laughs> I got it from other I things. About all the concussion. They talk about all the concussion problems now. I had that back before they knew anything about it. Me too. Um, but yeah. I, I got papers, man. I'm certified. <laughs> Looney Tune, huh? Look behind me, Lee. I'm right there with you. <laughs> Are you a football player, Eric? I'm still not getting a good, a good audio on you guys. Sometimes it comes in good. Sometimes it doesn't. Is there yeah, anything Pete. I know? Anything I can do on my end? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> No, your 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 audio is coming through good. We're we're gonna try to tee you up with some with some questions, and we'll just let you talk, and we'll we'll try not to step on you. So, oh no, listen, y'all uh, are doing good. Um, yeah, let, let, we were talking in in uh, in you know why we were getting you back up, and it, is it six classics that have been won on on five classics that have been won on the baits that you crafted. How, how does that make you feel? You know, I think I should have got a, a, a percentage, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you should. Heck yeah. You know, you, any anytime somebody recognizes something that you do, you 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 um you always feel good about it. But those guys really did it on their own. They they um they were able to find the fish and and do all that. I, I'm I'm tickled to death that they were able to catch them on something that I did, but. They deserve the credit. Two two classics on DB threes. Yeah, listen, the DB three. I've that's still one of my favorite lures. I biggest fish I ever caught twelve fourteen was on a DB three. How about that? Um, wow. But it, it's you know that's the bait that really got me started in this business. It was that, and I was doing I was doing a lot of there wasn't any any real fancy painting that was going on it you know before then it was. Coach Dog, you know, and black and chartreuse and, and black and pearl. I was running a recreation complex. And at this recreation complex, we had a, a, a ceramics class. And they used this iridescent powder on the ceramics. 
And I looked at that and thought, man, if I could get that on a fishing lure, that would be really pretty. And so I, I developed the paint, got, got it into the paint and, uh, started, I was painting one that was a brim color and became late spring brim LSB. Um, yeah. but that, that actually got Jim's oh, attention. Wow. That probably got Jim's attention more than the deep diver because when I first went to Jim, he had me working on paints, paint schemes and paint colors and stuff. There was a guy by the name of John Fox, and I don't know if y'all ever knew him. He was called John Fox, the American Angler. He had a TV yeah, had show. A show. Yes, sir. Um, well, I had met him through some shows and things before I went to work for Jim, and I had given him some of those deep divers. And so one day, about, I don't know, I'd been there maybe six months, and we're standing just outside Jim's office in a little area where he had and where the secretaries were. And we were talking, and um, this one of the secretaries walks up and says, John Fox wants to talk to you. And Jim says, I'll get it in a minute. He says, no, he wants to talk to Lee. <laughs> oh, Jim, Jim <laughs> like, you know, he doesn't know I know John. And so I go on the phone, and, and I start talking to John. And um, he's saying, man, y'all haven't built that bait yet. And I said, no, Jim's got me working on some paints and things. You know, I mean, I mean, I've been there like, six months i can't tell jim what we need to do and uh so I'm, I'm telling i'm trying to explain to him that you know i was doing this other stuff and and john keeps talking about how he has to have that that bait he's catching he killed the fish on the ones that he had and they're all he chewed up and he can't get any more and 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 finally jim says what baits he talking about he'd been listening to the conversation the whole time we didn't know it and john said man y'all got to build that bait and we were building it the next week. Wow. Hey, I know one of the questions we wanted to ask you was the machines, the replicators, you know, a handmade, true handmade crankbait, which you first started out doing, and then a replicator, you know, talk, talk to us a little bit about that. The technology behind it must have been, you, you built all those machines, right? I'm, I missed part of that, but I, but you was asking about the machines and handmade lures versus the, 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 um, the, the carved ones. I always tried to, you know, once I got in the business, I realized that I had to build stuff that was going to be manufacturable. Right. And that's one of the advantages that I, that I had, you know, that Jim is all Jim is uh, his uh, foresight and everything, but I was the plant manager and I was also the designer. So I knew in building the lure, I was, I was already building the lure, you know, in designing the lure, I was always built already building it in process. So I knew that I had to build it so it would fit into the, into the manufacturing scheme. So it had to be something that we could produce. So that was, you know, I mean, all of us have tried to change a spark plug on a car where you can't get to it. The engineer and the guy that does it just weren't on the same page. Sure. Well, this is this is a this is somewhere where I was able to get on the same page because it was me, um, and that was something that that Jim did. So, so we always I always built lures that were that you know that that would work into the machines. Now, Jim, again, like I said, they had some guys that were just super sharp there. Um, I mean, one of the guys was a true rocket scientist guy. You know I mean? He worked over at Cape Canaveral before he came to work for Jim. Wow. Um, we had a guy that was as good as I've ever seen with making equipment work. Um, he had worked for General Motors. He had been an engineer for General Motors. Um, so so Jim had just put together a really good team, and they designed the, the first machine that they already had a machine carving baits when I went there. They were carving bangalores and the DB threes and DB fours. Um, and those machines got a little more perfected, but they ne they didn't change a whole lot while I was there. And when I got out on my own, I um, my brother is, is also an engineer and he's an engineer. Um, well, I took the concepts that Jim had because you know the the basic concepts were really good. But I knew that they could be built better. And so I I designed the machine knowing what, what little bit I knew about building equipment. And 
built it with pillar blocks. I mean, it was really crude. And my brother built some of the parts. And I went home for, for Christmas. This is after I had left Jim. And I went home for Christmas and we assembled this machine. And my brother it starts it starts cutting out these crude bodies. And my brother's getting on the phone calling all of his engineering buddies, going, Man, you gotta come see this thing. It actually works. <laughs> but, but my brother, um, he was able to refine it because because he was an engineer. And one of the things that the way it works, it's like a three-dimensional key machine. You know how a key machine where they carve it and then the, that saw goes up and down. Yeah. Well, imagine that key rotating, and as that key rotating is, is follow that is following a three-dimensional template. And so the whole thing is is carving it out as it goes. Well, that's basically how it works. And Jim's and my original ones were the the forward motion was driven by hydraulic pump. Uh, well, there was two bad things about the hydraulic pump. Once was the hydraulic pump pushing it forward was um, it was always chasing it because it what there wasn't any relationship between the rotation and the forward motion. Hmm. So you were always having to to try to adjust that forward motion uh, through the valves. The other bad thing about the hydraulic pump was hydraulic fluid. It hmm. burned real good, and so. <laughs> we had a fire one day and I said, we, we don't need to use that anymore. So anyway, I called my brother one day. I'd been working on a lathe and you know, a lathe has, you can put it where it has an automatic rotation where every, it, for every rotation forward, it moves so many thousands. I mean, every rotation around, it moves so many thousands forward. So I call my brother and I say, why don't we do it? Something like a, you know, like a regular metal lathe where it moves forward automatically for every, Every rotation, so many thousands, he goes, oh, that's way too hard. I told him a good engineer could do it. Ah. <laughs> later, he calls me. He says, I got it worked out. <laughs> that was the real key because that, that, really, um, that really perfected that machine. Now, he put three kids through college selling those machines. He sold them in France, down in, all through Central America. Wow. And all over the United States. Wow. The deal was, the deal was he would build them for me and I'd pay him for the parts. And then he, if he could sell them, you know, you know, he could make as much as he wanted to. He'd always, he'd always send me the, the he'd always send it to me first so I could debug it because there was always little things that just had to be worked out and I'd get it to running right. And then we'd, we'd ship it to whoever wanted it. That's incredible. He, he, he really did refine that machine to make it. We, we, we want to... It got we're, to where, before you were always having to watch it and make sure it was going in. With the gel you tongue, no sticks would come in as long as 16 feet. And I would I would feed it. I, I, I built some PVC tubing where I could just stick that 16-foot piece in there. And I could stick that in there and go away and come back at lunchtime, man. And, you know, <laughs> I'd just keep running and keep running and keep running. <laughs> Uh, we want to get back to our message board, Lee, and we want to get we want to let right. our guys ask you a few more questions, and uh, and then we're going to let you go. Um, uh, Riz, what do you got for us? Dave yeah, well, Paul. now that I got the batteries back in my pacemaker, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> oh man, Dave Hall on the message board would like to know, um, Lee, when you're fishing a dock. How do you determine your first cast angle with a crankbait? Ooh. When I'm fishing a dock, like I said, I, I would, you know, where I fish docks, most of the docks I fish, you know, there's series of them you just all down the, all down the bank. So I will tune my crankbait to go either to the left or right, just, just a little bit. You don't want it running way off, just a little bit, you know, running maybe a foot or two over. And then... If I'm going down, if the if the the docks are on the right side, I will tune it to run just a little bit to the right. Then I'll make my first cast to be out in front of it, and that'll make it run over to the dock and around that front post. Oh wow! Then then I move up to where I'm casting right down the side. I'm casting down the left side of that dock, looking at it, and again that's making that crankbait, and it'll run around every one of those posts. You know, and if, you, if the posts are on the opposite side, I make it run left and do the same thing. Do you have and that way, rods? you don't have to cast. 
That way you don't have to cast it right up against the dock, but you can get it to run up under there. Very cool. Yeah. I, I might, I it might also have works real way. good. It also works real good. Like if you fish in places that have bluffs, mm -hmm. um, I know out like on some of the um, the lakes out west where they just have those sheer walls, yeah. or on some of the, on some of the rock, you know, the ones here too, up in the up in the um, um, Middle East. I guess what you'd call it, you know, where you have a sheer wall. Because what happens is the, the water level will sit at a while and it'll wash little little undercuts in there. So you make it, you get right down beside it and you make it run off to that side. So it's running up underneath. It's running right against that wall, but it's running up in those little cuts. And and you can get, you can get, you know, you can get up against that wall and, and get up in those cuts with a crankbait. Riz, what else do you got in the queue? How does the bill affect the action of the bait? And that question comes from Dwight, and I think he's referring to the you know the different kind of bill shapes that you can have on all these different kinds of crankbaits. Well, the bill you know the bill is is the heart of the lure. It's what it's where you get all your diving and and the um, the the shape of it. It's it's really it's it's hard to explain. Usually a wider a wider bill will give it more wobble and a narrower bill will give it less wobble. But that has to do also with the eye placement, where you put it in 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 relationship, you know, how far out it is. And it depends on the angle of the lip and it depends on the placement of the lip. It's really hard to say that that any one um bill design is better than the other. I can, you know. When you've done it a long time, you, you just you just get a feel for it. But I liked I liked that that old bag type of lip that we had. I don't know if y'all can, can can see this or not, but this is you know just a big fat lip. You've got <laughs> the water. You know the water flows off of each side, and that's what gives you the wobble. A lot of a lot of people. Can y'all see what I'm doing here? Oh yeah, yeah. good. Okay, a lot of people think that that the harder you crank a crankbait, the deeper it's going to go. And that's not true because what happens is if you crank it too hard, the water starts flowing off the, the top off the front end. And it does this forces it back up. It feels like you're cranking really deep, but all you're getting is resistance. Um, a good moderate retrieve is will usually get you your, your, uh, your deepest, because you're not you're not forcing the, the water to flow off the front; it's coming off the sides. Amazing! That's uh, Lee. That uh, we're gonna let you go. Thank you so much. It's been a it's been a privilege and an honor to have you on the show tonight. And I hope I hope you'll come back uh, sometime and share some more stories and yes. uh, some more di design stuff with us. Well, y'all got my number, man. I um, <laughs> y'all mind. I, I, I y'all probably can tell that I enjoy this. Um, I spent a lifetime doing it. I feel real blessed to have been able to do it. I'm thankful for all the guys that that purchased the stuff and made it available to me. And um, it's a real it's a real pleasure and an honor to to get to talk to you guys. Man, well, we're 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 gonna fully expect you to uh, redesign Zoom so that it functions better for us next time. We know we know you're good at that sort of thing. You mean Bagley? Oh, he's talking <laughs> about the computer Zoom. The oh, <laughs> I mean, Zoom I'm like, no. hey, this is this is actually this is actually my first Zoom call. I've done a lot better on, on Zoom call than I did on my first lures, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> That's amazing. Lee, thank you for everything. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, outstanding. Great. Lee Sisson, thank, well, thank you. you thank guys. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great to meet you, Lee. Thank you very much, man. Unreal. <laughs> that was um... – <laughs> yeah, come on, E. I was talking about. I, I think he could redesign the computer system. Yeah, I man. got you, man. My my brain is frankly wired. I heard Zoom, and I'm like Zoom. No, he's the smartest guy in the world. Lee Sisson is. Did you guys know that he is the smartest man in the world? Lee Sisson. Yeah, that. 
Well, it was it was fun. It was really great uh, having all you guys interact with him and listen to all the amazing stories. And there's so many more, you know. It's uh, it, I still crack up every time I think he taught, you know, Terry Bradshaw how to scramble because I guess he wasn't <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't blocking that good that day, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> great. Night, man. I loved it. Make, make <laughs> Terry scatter like a, a crazy crankbait. Dude, yep. I forgot to ask him too about Jerry Reed. He used to hang out with with uh, the the Smokey and the Bandit guy, Jerry Reed. I, I remember having lunch with that. Jerry Reed when I was a little kid. It was like I'm like, oh my god, that's the guy from Smokey and the Bandit. You're like, it was wow, dude, crazy, crazy. That that, that is some crazy stuff. Um, but man, what what a great interview! Thank you guys uh, for being here and uh, help thank you. With that. Yeah, it was wow. awesome. We didn't do awesome, anything. man. We didn't do anything, Pete. We just were here. That's all. I know. You, you, with the league, you, just, you just wind them up and let them go. You know? <laughs> he, was, he was amazing, man. Wow. So much yeah. there. Brian the yeah. Carpenter, you get the uh, the uh, Good Guest uh, Call of the Year Award with that. Producer of the, producer best of the best Year ever. Award. Brian best the Carpenter, best we've ever. been waiting to give this to you. Producer of the Year in the Bass Universe. BTC, yeah. please stand up. Yeah. <laughs> Slim Shady. And, and special yeah. Thank special you. Thank shout you. out. To, uh, to our advisor Ken Duke, who, yes. uh, who who was amazing, not only with uh, you know giving us some recommendations, but asking some amazing questions, and then you know knowing all the answers. And we know. have a grand prize trivia courtesy of the of the Ken Duke coming up soon. We got a Facebook like and share coming up, and uh, okay. yeah, man, let's uh, let's start winding down. It's nine thirty. We get yeah. that bathroom break or anything, or what? Do can I go to the bathroom, uh, Dean? We we got you, Pat. You head on out, buddy. <laughs> I got, I asked you got for, it. Well, I'll be back. I just needed to ask permission because I didn't want to yeah. get attention for just leaving the class. You know what I mean? It's a, it's a, it's a five-point penalty, but you can go. Okay, thank you. Do I need a pass? Or do I? Just go, Pat. Okay. Just go. Longest exit ever. Uh, <laughs> are you doing okay, Epic Eric? Oh, man, are you kidding me? I could keep going till midnight, man. This was... And freaking fantastic, man. I had a page of notes for this show. Yep. You know, man, Ken Duke one ups me on the trivia thing. I brought out the four <laughs> classics and he's got to go five on me. Ken Duke. Anyway, <laughs> dang, man. And that came from the Bagley website. What? Ken Duke is smarter than the Bagley website. It's just what, what can you say, man? Yeah, Ken no. Duke is the man. How about one that? of many things that he's smarter than, no doubt. That was. Yeah. It's pretty. It's pretty good. I, I was really wanting to, uh, and then unfortunately the audio was bad, and the communication was, you know, not getting through at the end. But I loved talk, him talking about the lip and how the the hydraulics of the water coming around the crankbait lips and how it you oh, know man. changes the actions and depths. Uh, man, that that you could go on forever. And and the complexity of the placement of the eye. Oh yeah. Like you know, you think okay, well the angle of the lip determines everything. But then oh. you got to change the angle. Then you got to change the placement of the eye. Then the, the mass of the body. Oh my gosh! There's, there's think about that. You know, from a innovation standpoint, you know, Pete being first to do that. There's a lot of copycat mm. baits out there. You know, all the plastic baits. Oh, you know, they got to bow to the originators of a lot of these crank baits, lip angles, square bills. You know, it's extraordinary, mm. man. And what else we didn't get into he is uh, the other companies that he's. Uh, consulted for, which are Arbogast. many, 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 yeah. many. Right. Arbogast was one. What were the other ones? Uh, 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 Man's Bait Company, Hedden, yep. Um, yep. Strike King. I'd like to know what he designed for Strike King. Yeah. How, what 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 other uh, things has he been involved with? Who knows? Who knows? But BTC, do you want to do, you want to do that trivia question now? Do you want to ask it? Do you want me to ask it? Uh, I got it, bro. You got it? Probably. All right. Yeah, no, we got a freshie. Give me a second here. I'll call nice. right, I'm flipping Guys, through. if you're over on Facebook, don't forget to like and share tonight's feed. There's still time. Uh, if you like and share tonight's feed, and at the end of the show, we pick you through our randomizer, you are going to win an awesome TH Marine G-Force pack celebrating yeah. TH Marines 45 years, giving you the best products from Transom to Trolling <laughs> Motor. So like and share tonight's feed. There is still time, but without further ado, I think 
Shout, shout out to TH. I'm sorry. Shout out to TH Marine real quick while you're saying that, Riz. Oh my gosh, the hydraulic jack plate up on Lake Champlain and mm, in, maybe. Yeah. in 20 to 30 mile an hour winds. Oh my gosh, it kept kept the prop wet, kept us safe, kept us <laughs> got us out and back. Uh, thank you, TH Marine. Awesome right. Atlas. And, right. and, and Pete, we uh. So I, I, I got to work this in here because one of our uh, loyal subscribers and Bash University TV, uh, Bash U Live show watchers, had a baby this week. Matt in Wisconsin. Matt Eichinger. Matt Eichinger had himself a beautiful baby girl, Ella Grace. And I would like to oh. take a second here to say congratulations to Matt. And he said he already Ella got Grace. her a Bash University TV subscription. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, three days old so good work Matt. that's how you do it. wow right. uh, get them started early that's thank right. you all right you ready thank for you this here's the the, uh, yeah. the grand prize yeah, trivia question it. courtesy of ken duke and this is for the people not the panel fred young oh, yeah. started making his big o crankbait when spinal when a spinal injury put him in a full body cast who was his who was his employer at the time Fred Young, yeah, made the big. You know that one, eh? when, yeah. That's Fred uh, Young started, you know yeah. But I'm I'm hitting the restroom because I can't speak. <laughs> <laughs> Fred Young started making his big O crankbait when he when spinal injuries put him in a full body cast. Who was his employer at the time? I I honestly have absolutely no idea. Oh, I don't know. Ken Duke's amazing. That's like why does yeah. Ken Duke even know that, and why does Epic Eric even? That's what right. I'm, right. I, I. I'm surprised Eric knows that. Yeah. That's... Ken's Ken's lived it all. He's yeah. Eric, he's stalked yeah. it all. Hey, did you ever? <laughs> did you guys have in New Jersey like a cartoon called um, uh, Tennessee Tuxedo with Chumley? Huh? As, as it a seems kid, familiar to me, but I I I, I don't there, know. Well, there was a scientist. Well, actually, I think the guy that plays Get Smart was the the the, the penguin or the. Uh, the Tennessee tuxedo guy, but, the voice, uh, the voice. Yes. Thank you. Um, but there was a, 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 a guy that was the smartest guy in the world. And, um, his name was Mr. Whoopi and Mr. Whoopi would go in the closet and get his three DBB and he knew everything. And like, if you could combine a person, I think it would be like <laughs> Lee Sisson and Ken Duke would be <laughs> like, they know everything. They know everything about bass fishing and, and how to do stuff. And science. That's that. That's the guy. That would be the perfect combination for that. And smartest, <clears throat> smartest guys ever. Yeah, I, I can't believe Eric even has a guess at this and knows the answer to this question. And you know what? This is actually probably the longest we've been without somebody answering the question. That's a hard. Can, that's a hard. It, this is a tricky one. Yeah. I'm. I mean, normally I'm. Ken gives amazing questions that are challenging. But our panel, our guys are so strong and fast, they get they get his answers in 30 seconds or less. Yeah, so I mean, this is, this is a rarity. Yeah. Yeah. There's, There's some, some – well, I don't know. Whoa. Robot. You just, yeah. You went down. I already got that real quick. Wow. Uh, that's because I, I just came from my JDM bank room. Holy cow, is that amazing? Man. That's like, like a robot. robot. He's predator now. I knew he wasn't yeah. real, Brian. I knew that. You've lost your audio, Eric. Your your audio has gone haywire since you have uh, paused and come back. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, Still you do your lips moving, and and you do. You sound like the predator from <laughs> uh, the movie The Predator. <laughs> oh, good job, Pete. Oh, we have a winner. We have a winner. That is amazing. Who knows the New answer to that? We have a winner. The winner is Lee C. Lee Sisson. Lee Sisson. With the, <laughs> with the, with the <laughs> Atomic <laughs> Energy Commission, was his employer. When he had a spinal injury, putting him in a full body cast, the Atomic Energy Commission. Congratulations, Lee C. Right on. Wow. Well done. Well you done. knew that? that? Epic, Epic Eric, just nod. I did my homework right. before the show. 
My man, how about it? Wow. Look at you. I studied up today because I knew we were going to talk I... about Fred Young and the Big O. <laughs> so I did a little research. So what, so what was the story about that? Like he, he got injured and he's sitting there just a bass fisherman just carving away in his, in his, in his bed? Yeah, he, he was on top of a thermonuclear device and <laughs> um, it accidentally... That's normal. Yeah, that's normal, right, no. Uh, there was no details on exactly how the spinal injury happened. But that and was this was in the 60s. This was in the 60s. And did you guys know that someone made his widow an offer for his collection that she had in the house for a hundred thousand dollars? Wow. Wow. Did you, did you do that, Eric? I was gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> it was me in 1974. I didn't have enough paper out money, so I fell a little short. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. wow. Yep. Original Big O's. Does anybody out there have an original Big O? Balsa. Fred Young, original Big O. Last I checked, they're going for about 500 Really? An original Fred Young. They made a reproduction of the Balsa Big O. Yep. Do you have an original? Not the, the reproduction. I think yeah. that was brought this out. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if you can find an original hand carved big O, 500 clams. So, how many different colors do you have? I got a lot of them, but no originals. <laughs> I don't have an original. Um, and, and Pat, he did make some saltwater lures. Did you know that? That Fred Young did. Correct. So, that one you showed me the other day, could that have been? A saltwater lure? I, I don't know what it is. I have I have it here, and and the hooks on it could indicate that a a absolutely. Um, this this is a unnamed balsa bait. Even Epic Eric, who knows everything, damn, we should ask Lee Sisson, shouldn't we? You should have uh, shown him, man. But I, we don't know what that is, and I actually have a smaller version of it as well. And they do have those stainless saltwater hooks, Eric. They sure do. Yeah, I mean, maybe, you know, it, it was it was smack. That little one was smacking of a wee bait for me, but I don't know, man. It's got a rounded body, not a true flat side. Yeah, I just don't know. Maybe yeah. one of the viewers out there in crankbait land in, in the Bass Universe can identify. That's, uh, that's, that, that is an unnamed, uh, mysterious uh, crankbait. I don't know what it is, man. It, it, well, it, it, I, let me, let me. Wee baits to me, West England. I want to talk about a, a, a crankbait that everybody should have because up at Lake Champlain, uh, once again, the wigglewort dominated the catch. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, when we were cranking, we on saw you small mean. mouth and large mouth. Um, just, just an amazing multi species uh, deal that. Um, that just catches them, man. OG, OG Pete, um, wiggle wart. Are you talking about new wiggle wart or, or fresh off, fresh off the shelf? Hey, hey, look at that, man. There you go. And let me ask you a question since you're a wiggle wart fan. I know you got some vintage ones. I know you fished the new ones. Apparently the bait was ruined, but they figured it out and brought the good one back. So do you think Spro has done anything different with the rock crawler? Rock crawler versus wiggle wart. True question for you. Hmm. You know, I I the I have played around with the rock crawler and mm -hmm. I've looked at it. It's a great bait that Spro sure. and Mike McClellan designed, and he designed it to mimic what the old wart is doing. You sure. used to do, which was you know it was actually an error. You know they it was the old wart was where you know it would hunt. It wouldn't perform. Hmm. Hmm. All right. All right. Yeah. Well, as Pete, Pete was saying, it would I, I think Mike has made a hell of, and Spro has made a hell of a crankbait. You know, it's a good crankbait, but the wiggle wart itself is, uh, is, is amazing. You know, it just, it deflects, it, it hits that depth zone that is so key. And that's one of the things I love so much about it is it, it hits that like four to seven foot zone. Yeah. And, it just it just triggers them. Is that and their crawl you, patterns and their their all their patterns? It just, I mean, it just works so well. You guys said that the new 
wiggle warts? They because I'm unaware of this. Did, did they like figure something out where supposedly the wiggle warts are now back to how they were? Is that something? Is that a thing? I wouldn't I, say they're back to where they were, but it still has that, that crazy hunting gang. There's a great video if anybody can find it on YouTube, which compares OG wiggle warts and that crazy trying to find the center hunting action yeah yeah the rock crawlers to you know that wiggle wart style bait and it and it showed in a clear pool the difference in how the baits tracked and that's i think that's really important because you know action um depth speed those are all keys that pete pete's talking about and and so i think the specific question is pete comparing the og wiggle wart to the new wart, do you feel like the new? I don't wart throw the. I don't throw the OG wiggle wart. Okay, so you just. I, I don't throw. Them. I don't awesome. throw them. The, the 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 current warts are. They just so they're they're they're. You know what you're going to get out of the pack, and they right. trigger the bites. You know, and I use That's them. All that matters. A lot of times, I'm not even using them where they're impacting the bottom. I use them in two ways. I'm either def getting deflection strikes where I'm banging it off the rocks. Sure. And my producer is 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 like a diehard. I gave him some wiggle warts, and that's he doesn't fish. He doesn't bass fish, which is awesome. That's what you need in a yeah. producer. You need it because you need somebody that can do the editing and do the yeah. filming and get, not get, get obsessed about? with the fishing part. You know. Yeah. I didn't and, get uh, <laughs> but the, well, that's because you're obsessed. But uh, <laughs> but we we were we were out Makes and. I, I showed him how to use the wiggle wart and, and he just, he caught them. Now he takes them everywhere he goes and he just throws wiggle wart <laughs> on rocks. Doesn't matter where he's at. Candlewood Lake. Oh, you're talking uh, about Lake Jeff. Lake, talking about Jeff. Oh yeah. I yep. was confused. I thought you meant Brian. At uh, I don't get nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, you're wearing a sharp hat over there. I mean, what yeah. are you talking about? Oh, I, he, I earned that brother. <laughs> Pete, so you were up, you were up at Champlain, and mm -hmm. you had a lot of wind. How was the water clarity? Were you throwing ghost colors? Were you throwing the opaque colors? Like, what are your go-to wart colors? If you if you wouldn't mind sharing, there you know, there's there's three colors that I throw. I throw the fire tiger, and mm -hmm. uh, and that was a big deal this week. And you know, the other one, there's a a crawl, and I'm I'm guilty. I don't even know the color. I should have it here. But it's got orange tips on the bill, and oh, yeah. it's a brown crawl. It's like a spring crawl color. That is an amazing weapon. And the other one's a shad pattern. Yeah. Uh, you know, whenever I'm fishing around that, and just just between those three colors, I'm I'm not fanatical, as you know, Eric. I'm not fanatical yeah. about colors and flakes and patterns. I'm, you know, for me, it's about you know I, I got to get around the fish, and and I'll right on. one of those three colors. I'll figure out a way to trigger them, and uh, but but we did have a lot of steam. It's great, great observation. The wind, I, I swear, the wind was hammering so hard, and mm. uh, the cr the crankbait, the wiggle wart helped us find the fish. We used That's a awesome. couple uh, things like Carolina rigs and tubes to catch them. Sure, and uh, oh, you know, wow. we just it's just you know it, it's just an amazing place, amazing fishery, and we did an on water training trip, guys. And it's available at, at the bassuniversity.com. You can oh, fish with Randy Blaukett. You can fish with uh, guys in Florida, uh, Lake Lanier, um, some amazing anglers that can really help your fishing game. So no matter where you are in the country, on water training is available to you through the Bass University. Yep. Uh, so go to the bassuniversity.com and check it out. You, you can go, I did that you can go with back in the day. Oh, so sorry. sorry. Go ahead, Brian. I was just gonna say you can go uh, looking for aliens and Sasquatch with Travis Manson. Oh, <laughs> a lot of opportunities out there. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, but I would go for the bass fishing first. So I, I, I reached out to Pete. We met for those of you who don't know at a at a at a at a bass show, and he was hanging around with Steve Chaconis, a guide on the Potomac who I know very well, and uh, we got right into it with crankbait fishing. We started talking about Jerry Lures, <laughs> and. Um, so I, I was like intrigued with just Pete's ability to teach and his knowledge and how he, how he kept it simple. So I wanted to up my, my game and, and in particular on the upper bay. And so we did a couple of bass classes out there and, and Pete, I got to tell you, man, th those were, 
some of the best days I've had on the water, man. I, I brought out my CP bait. You mentioned Craig Powers, and I caught that five and change off a of barge. I still got that picture. I think it's on my IG. And uh, we, we just, we marveled at it, man. We did some tournaments together later in the year. And um, just, I learned a ton from you, man. Thank you. Uh, so I'm, I'm tipping my hat to the Bass University, but but more importantly, the best money you'll ever spend is is booking a on the water training class. I mean, think about what we spend on a rod and reel combination. Let me tell you, don't buy a rod and reel this year and go find somebody to book a bass class with. You will not regret it. These are guys that do it for a living. Yeah. 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 We, and we vet, we vet all of our guys, so we bring you the best of the best over there. And thank you for that, Eric. And it was sure. it was awesome fishing with you all those times. Yeah, man, and, thanks. Uh, you know, it's a lot, it's lots going on. And, and let me tell you, Champlain, uh, it was, the wind was ferocious on day one. Um, and, uh, the, the weather got a li- freezing cold. It was crazy, freezing cold, 30 degrees in the morning all day on day two. And then, uh, the day three, we were up there. It was calm and sunny yeah. and oh, 60 wow. degrees. And, and, and we, uh, we were able to sit on a place and, and catch 50 bass off of one shoal. That's on incredible. uh on lake champlain it's it's amazing and here's a here's one of the really cool parts is we saw we saw two other boats out on that day and they were both duck hunters unbelievable um, wow yeah, we had we had the whole lake the the leaves were changing it was fall up in the adirondacks and wow. you know the bass are biting and uh it, it's a shame to watch place you know because you see down south you know and on like on the potomac eric where you're at I know, you know, uh, Pat, you know, I don't know how the fishing is in your area, but in the fall up north here, it's absolutely amazing. Absolutely here too, but it's cranking time, man. It's, it's cranking in spinner boats. Mm. Yeah. Dang. You love it. And you go to, you watch the elites right now on, they were on Santee and uh, congratulations sure. to Brandon Polinick winning that Bass University instructor. Uh, you know, all of his content is available over there as, as well as, uh, Carl Jacobson who finished second, um, you know, great instructors at Bass University, first and second down his hand, but struggling, uh, to catch them. And, you know, they did the same thing, uh, the previous week and, uh, we're going to see how they do this week. Uh, where are they this week? Chick. They're going to Icky Monkey. Yep. Chickamauga. Mm-hmm. Chickamauga. Chickamauga. Yes, sir. Yeah. Maybe we'll see some frog fishing. You know, Hope so. I want to see crankbaits. Give me a cranking derb. I need it. If we're <laughs> in the fall, Pete, why are we not having a good old fashioned winding derb? You know what I mean? I They're know. It. I know. Where it's well, cranking season. Yeah. I, I, I mean, wind, wind that spinner bait, wind that crankbait. It's fall. That, I mean, in my head, when, when I heard that the fishing season was extended because of the Ronas, I'm thinking, it's a winder's paradise, man. <laughs> it's, 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 yeah. It's just not quite fall yet, Pat. It's yeah, like, I know. Yeah, I know. We're, we're in between us right now, but it's coming, okay. brother. You're getting that fall turnover. The lakes are turning over, yeah. making it really tough scattering the fish. Do you think uh, Santee was was turning over, Pete? Uh, you know, I I don't know uh, if they have turnover like we think of it in in some of these places up here. They might, you know, it just gets tricky down there. Yeah. Um, I do know about the grass has disappeared from Santee and I wish it, they would let it come back, but they killed it. And it was, wow. it, it's so amazing. But that, that all being said, until the, the fall comes around, things get funky and, uh, get, get really tricky. But I, I want to say, um, I want to give a shout out to Aaron Martins. want to invite everybody to go over to charity auctions today.com, uh, for Aaron Martins. Uh, benefit auction taking place the third through the 18th and there's a lot speaking of cool things you could uh trips you could go on with anglers a lot of our guys kvd uh mark zona um justin lucas so many guys have donated their time for this cause to help aaron out as he's struggling uh with his medical situation Wish them all the best, Gerald Swindle, Hank Cherry, Ot Defoe. Uh, so many you can build cool. bid on a day on the water with one of these guys, and I want to invite you guys to go over and do that as well as jerseys that are available, or you could just donate, and uh, and they're up to fifty five thousand dollars. They got a goal of four hundred thousand dollars trying to raise for Aaron Martin, so he's one of our uh, favorite instructors. He's 
uh, just such an amazing individual and uh, as, as dealing with some really, really tough medical situations. So I want to go and, and, and help him out. And uh, I saw I saw he we, was in 20 or 21st after day one. On the U.S. Open, is that right? I, I didn't follow that. Yeah, wow. yeah, that was Monday. Was day one. I was trying to pull up today's results. I couldn't. I couldn't quite find them. But uh, the events Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I believe, and he was uh, he was right there at twenty twenty one twenty first. I think wow, twelve pounds is that. leading it, and he's at like eight or nine. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Oh, a mark, man. Yeah. Go, go Amart. Lake Mead. I love that place. Love that place. Yeah. It I always want to fish the U.S. Open. Hopefully uh, get a chance to get out there and fish that tournament someday. It's one of the original Ooh. great tournaments. Mm, great it's to see funny. them out there. It, it's funny that everybody loves it. It's a grind, man. Like 12 pounds is, is, well, is really, yeah. really a big bag for what everybody's got. Well... Well, I don't know about now, but when I fished it, it was that way too. It, it's a small fish fishery for whatever reason, yeah. but it wasn't a grind. Like everybody had limits. Like everybody okay. caught them. Um, but you know, when getting, was that, Pete? Like when were you out there? It, it was eighteen forty-seven. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> you know, yes, it is. Honey, yeah. <laughs> Are you <listening>? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we had a trolling sail as opposed to a trolling motor. Did back you have yeah. a scuttle paddle, Mr. Gold? Yeah, Lori, Lori Rapala was in that tournament, man. Floating minnow. It was, gosh, it's got to be 20 years ago, or at least 20 years ago. Uh, Dude, but like, Lake Mead is like a mystical lake, right? I mean, remember the Clun stories of Lake yeah, Mead? Yeah, you know, where he saw a vision and went yeah. to a place and caught fish that he didn't really think is ever existed. But I know? think that was peyote induced. Allegedly. <laughs> yeah. My God, I don't know. You got a guy, but <laughs> <laughs> and then he pitched a no hitter on it. So I don't know. But <laughs> I can tell you, I can tell you this: it's the it's the most unusual place on earth that I've ever been fishing. Uh, like it, fishing in canyons, right? It's crazy. It yeah. is. It's like fishing on Mars. It's uh, you know, you're out in the you drive through the desert. You know, you come out of Vegas, which you, where you're staying in the city, and and then you drive 30, 40, 50 minutes through the desert and there's nothing, nothing at all. Mounds and cactus and dunes and, you know, and, and then you come to this lake and the water clarity is, is like 40 feet of visibility. Wow. And, and you put your boat in and, and, you know, you got that vertigo feeling like when you're, you look down, you feel like you're falling, the water's so clear, wow. That's you know, wow. it is. And, you, and you're fishing, like my pattern in that tournament, I was, I was fishing tumbleweeds, you know, the stuff in the old Westerns yeah. that would roll yeah. down the street. That that's what I fished. You know, they were, they were tumbleweed plants that were submerged because the lake had come up and, uh, and, and, you know, you're trying to bang your Sanko. crankbait by bang your crankbait. Senko had wasn't alive <laughs> back then, but Trying to bang, I was fishing a crankbait. I was banging my crankbait into the tumbleweeds, and uh, and catching them out of that crystal clear water. You would hit the tumbleweed. The the minerals would deposits would explode off the limbs, and then what? you would. It, it's the most amazing thing because you would see see it like you would see a white flash, wow. and then you would feel a bite. And I'm like, what in the heck's happening to me? But what what would happen is the bass's mouth would open. And you would see the white of his throat. And you, that's why you, you would see the white flash. And then your crank, you would feel it on your crankbait rod. That's and, crazy. Um, yeah, you just, you just call a lot of fish. If you throw a dingleberry into a tumbleweed, you'll get a bite. <laughs> 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 but it has to have least. You better go to the doctor for that one. Yeah. Hey, Glusik, <laughs> I got to ask you something r real quick. But while we're on Lake Mead and, and, and talking about clone and, and tumbleweed, um, do you remember when Clun had the, the angler course, the, uh, advanced angler yeah. course, and I was texting with, with Mike today about it. I, w I can't find mine anywhere. The, um, and I, and Ike and Ellie has some of it left. Do, do you have that Rick Clun angler 
uh, workshop or whatever. Advanced angler oh. pamphlet. Do you, yeah. have, do you guys have that in full intact? I I I bought that publication. Yeah, I subscribed to it, and uh, I, I had several of them. I, I I mean I I'd have to look for it, but I the, here's the odd thing, and my wife is upset with me about it. Is anything bass fishing that comes into this house will never leave this house. <laughs> so I have it. I have it somewhere. Wow. I mean, so we need you know? to look like manuscripts, Lucic. So I can now. I yeah. with Mike today. He has some of them. So we need to mm -hmm. find out which ones Mike has, and then we need to find out which ones you have. And then we put the uh, Ark of the Covenant together in in, <laughs> in in coming to a theater near you this this spring. I'll I'll look I'll look for it for sure. I'll look for it. Um, it's got it's a, it's around here somewhere. Please. that was amazing stuff. They went to survival training. I know Randy Blauket and uh, Clun. They did they did that kind of stuff. Um, you know, it was they it was some really radical training to try to be intuitive and, and, and ahead of the patterns. Man. Oh, was, I remember seeing those videos on it. He had them in the smoke houses. Is some videos on YouTube on that, right? Yeah. Sweat and, Lodge. So exactly. That was it. Dude, Takahiro was a student. You know who else was? That's right. right. Oh yeah. Those uh, one, one of David, awesome. David, David Walker was a student. And so was Brian, the carpenter's buddy, uh, Byron Velvick. It was. Yeah, as Byron, well. Byron, oh, Byron's like fifth right now in the uh, one bass open after day one. Byron is, and, and is that not uh, awesome? Seriously, I, I, how awesome is that that Byron's up there, dude? I mean, he's rested, I guess. I don't know. No. I think it's How's his hair? Hey, Probably we, have a like and share. we have a like and share Facebook contest going on right now. We want to give you one last chance. Uh, like and share it real quick, real Let's quick. Let's go four we're hours. We're at three. <laughs> Let's go four. <laughs> <laughs> you guys can, but I'm shutting this down. <laughs> hey, let's get you back on the phone. <laughs> He's ready to go. <laughs> Hold on. I got to just show something. Rick Klein. <laughs> <laughs> He'll be right back. I'll be right back. All right. For, for all you Rick Klein oh, freaks, oh, this is goodness. the original set. You old say oh, for man. you. Right, we we need to put that on top of the Ark of the Rick Cun Covenant. Right, dude, right. that blue color that's hidden by his head is actually yeah. an amazing color. That midnight color right there. Hello. Uh huh. Yep. How about how about a Rick Cun on the Potomac River, Eric? What is the crankbait that that he credited as scoring so much money for him over the years that he didn't talk about until he finally had to give it away? And he, oh, and he made it famous on one. the Potomac River. Right here, guys. That's right there. That is the little Norman. That is it. That yeah, is exactly it. Yeah, it's it's the and this is one of the OG ones. This is the uh, the, the crappie uh, crankbait. It, it it is, and it was originally called the tiny end as well. Oh, that's yeah. right. It was. And and, and yeah. um and Rick Clun, what he would do with this bait, <laughs> he would keep the normal size hook, or or let's say he would put a size four. Or a size, pardon me, a size he six. He would upsize the hook. A size six on the front, but a four on the back, like a big dog. Norries remade that crankbait called the Norries Worming. And the, the keep a shot, the worming crank. Yes, sir. And then Rick Clun used that version in the 2000 Bassmaster Classic on Lake Yes, Cutting he Man. did. Chicago. Yes, he did. That's a great post spawn little deal right there. Small crankbaits, man. <laughs> hey, They'll whip man. your ass. I'm telling you, that's a whole. That's a whole show I, I, I think I got them. And that's crankbaits. I think I got them started back up again. We're going to go another three hours. Oh, no, Dang. Dang. <laughs> Dang I got the mouse right here. <laughs> he has the power. I got the power. Let me make Riz, coffee. Riz, 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 who's the winner, buddy? Hey, Pete. Go ahead, bro. Yeah. Uh, our, our buddy John McGraw drew a. Uh, uh, as as a as as a rider drew Rick Clun in a tournament. And I, mm. I don't recall awesome. recall where, but Rick was throwing uh, the the uh, Norman crappy crank. Was there a monk involved? <laughs> I would there, say there's probably. the Norries worming crank shot, Pete, with a four on the back pat and it's Japanese hooks. They are stupid okay. sharp. Amazing this little joker. When you need a bite, just gonna say it, dude. That bait hunts. That Tifa shot. Yep. That worm and crank that hunts, buddy. Yeah, that's right. I can hold. Who won the contest? 
<laughs> the winner of tonight's Facebook like and share for the Bash University Live is Cody Ebner. Congratulations, yeah! Cody oh, Ebner. Yeah. You're the winner of the big three-hour marathon Bass University special on Drake Base. Congratulations, Cody. Yes. <laughs> Took the words right out of my mouth, Pat. Right. <laughs> I, mean, I do a little show myself sometimes, you know, and I, I, it's hard not to talk. <laughs> <laughs> oh by the way so um so so uh yeah pat you've got tomorrow off but you'll be back next wednesday you want to talk about it, Tease yeah, it uh, up? Yeah, absolutely uh wow. we have a bass elite big ass party going on what? and we uh we so ha so far have frank tally he's gonna uh frank the tank coming over to the house he's gonna oh. have a little fun and then uh my old buddy uh my former i, I used to manage this kid uh, until he fired me, uh, Brandon Palinick, BMP. Uh, he's coming aboard the crazy train uh, on, on Wednesday the 21st. And then um, mystery question mark uh, guest, uh, whoever wins this Chicky Monkey Derp. Well, I'm gonna Epic get Eric official. Yeah, oh, epic. I'm sorry. Oh, you know, you can enter, Eric. It's not too late to enter that elite series. I'm gonna. Yeah. <laughs> hey, money talks, bullshit walks. That's what we learned yeah. out of this. You know what I mean? Text in the mail, baby. <laughs> 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 all right it's getting crazy in here hey that guy cody won way to go code good right. job <laughs> and Bass, we'll be back next tuesday um and we uh i'd actually talked to brandon leading up to tonight's show but they are they are practicing for uh for uh the chick right now today today i believe was day one of practice so uh, I, I gave him every opportunity to get out of coming on tonight because uh because, you know, it's, that's a lot for them guys. And, and, yeah. and he took and it, which to is Frank, cool. Thanks to Frank Talley for coming on yeah. during practice. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah. Was awesome. He was awesome. Dude. Dude. He was awesome. Pat, was you're awesome. going to have a great time with him next week. Frank was Frank's phenomenal. So uh, we may have Brandon next next week. Or, We're going to uh, screech through the quad, actually, me and Frank. Today. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see what we're going to do. Hey, thanks, Pat Renwick from Straycast for hanging out with us. Yes. Thank you very much, Pat. I, I, Thank you for having me. Thank you, Epic Eric, for bringing all the knowledge and all the cool stuff. Thank you, buddy. Got a man. Really, uh, honor to be on. Epic Thank you Eric very much. Official on Instagram. Is that what it is? That's it. That's it. Yep. 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 Well, awesome. Lee Sisson. Thank you guys very much. It was a great show. Enjoyed it a lot. Really? Uh, Lee Sisson. It. Thank you uh, for, for sharing all the stories. And it was amazing to, to have such a legend of the sport on tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ken Duke, yes, uh, for helping us craft tonight's show and and uh, doing what you do. Appreciate it very much. Thank you, BTC. Thank you, Riz. Uh, appreciate you guys. And I uh, want to thank everybody for watching. We have some great stuff coming up at Bash University TV. Uh, we've got uh, Brian Thrift on how to approach new water, as wow. well as uh, Gerald Swindle with his – one, one of the most popular seminars ever on Bass University, which is positive mental attitude uh, that are coming up on Bass University TV, as well as Released Greg today. De Palma. The, the, is the positive mental attitude came out today. So that's it's, right. Uh, I, it's I, up there. You can you can check out a little teaser action on social media right now if you'd like, actually. Ooh, extra positive. Yeah, good. Mm. Yeah, go extra check it out. Positive. And, uh, and GDP, Greg De Palma, uh, Mega 360 for Humminbird, how he manages his Mega 360. Uh, he's really advanced in his use of that, and he's, it's going to be helpful to anybody that wants to move in that direction. And everybody should because it's amazing technology that's going to help you catch more fish. So right. thanks, everybody, for watching. We're going to see you. you right back here next Tuesday night. Good night, everybody. Thank hey, you, guys. Peace, Bass Galaxy. Thank you for having me.